Okay, good morning everybody. I think we'll make a start. Uh, my name is Chris Bishop. I'm chairing the uh, first tutorial here at uh, NIPS and uh, first of all I just want to say a very warm welcome to NIPS 2013. It looks like it's going to be a great conference. Um, we're going to kick off with a tutorial on uh, uh, deep learning for computer vision from uh, Rob Fergus. Looking at his CV, I mean, Rob is really one of the young stars of computer vision, and I can see that uh, one of the secrets to a successful career, I think, is, is working with the right people in the early stages. He, he kicked off with a, a master's in electrical engineering at Caltech with Pietro Perona. He then did his PhD at Oxford with Andrew Zissiman, followed by a two-year postdoc with Bill Freeman at, uh, at MIT at the uh, Computer Science and AI Lab. And he's now Associate Professor at the Courant Institute for Mathematical Sciences in New, at New York University. Um, Rob has numerous prizes. I shan't list them all. I'll just mention three of them. A CV, CVPR Best Paper Prize, a Sloan Fellowship, and the IEEE Longit Higgins Prize. Now, this is a, a two-hour two tutorial on a fascinating topic. Um, what we decided to do for this tutorial, rather than sort of have a coffee break and have people getting out and getting back in, that'll take a lot of time. Rob's going to have around about one hour into the tutorial, he's going to have a little demo session to kind of break things up. If you need to slip out for a cup of coffee, you can do so. Um, the other thing is questions. What we'd like to do is to have a 10 or 15 minutes at the end for general questions. If um, Rob is a fantastic speaker, so it's unlikely that you won't understand what he's saying. But if he says something and you're really not sure and you really want to ask a question of clarification, then please do so. Hopefully Rob will repeat the question for the, for the video. But generally speaking, we'll, we'll take most of the questions at the end. So uh, that's enough for me. So with that, I'll invite Rob to give his tutorial. Thanks very much for that. Oop, is this on? Yeah. Okay, so uh, thanks to Chris for that introduction. Um, now, this is just a one slide overview of what I'm going to talk about. Um, it's really going to be about, uh, you know, obviously deep learning is a very, you know, big area these days, and I'm just going to focus on sort of one uh, particular part of it. So we're going to be looking at essentially object recognition uh, with, super, with convolutional networks, okay? These, you know, supervised models, and we're not going to talk really about unsupervised learning. Um, and, you know, these models have been around for a while, but we're going to uh, look at how they've been applied recently very successfully to natural images. So, in, in some sense, you know, complicated, big images rather than MNIST digits or things like that. Um, we will talk a little bit at the end about, you know, what these networks can be used for, you know, in other, for other vision problems. Okay, so let's just start off with some motivation. And this is very much from a sort of computer vision perspective. So, um, I guess, you know, for a long time in computer vision, uh, the sort of prevailing paradigm has been that you will just take, you know, you have some nice hand design features like SIFT or HOG that you will extract from your image. Um, you might then do some kind of high level uh, feature building um, and then that gets thrown into some sort of trainable classifier like an SVM. And the key uh, sort of point here is for the most part, those features aren't really learned, okay? They've been sort of handcrafted by sort of, you know, clever vision people um, and they do indeed perform pretty well. And, uh, you know, if we look at a lot of the sort of progress um, in recognition over the last sort of 10 years, I would argue that most of that has really come from the features. That, you know, when, when things like SIFT and HOG arrived, finally things started to work, whereas previously they just didn't really at all. Um, and, you know, if you look at, for example, uh, you know, some of the very successful work for object detection, uh, this model, you know, by Pedro Felsenschwab and uh, David Ramanan and Ross Gershik, uh, this is essentially a, a pretty straightforward linear classifier on top of hog features, but it does actually work very well. And if you look at the sort of classification approaches that work well, this is, you know, one from the Singapore group. Um, they have, you know, all manner of features, you know, hog, sift, color sift, and so on, all being extracted uh, from the image. So they have this complete menagerie of features, and they do actually get some pretty decent results. So the question then is, of course, you know, where, if we want to sort of improve things, what do we do? Should we be focusing on the classifiers? trying to build better versions of those, or should we be, are the features still not as good as they could be? And I think uh, one very interesting paper that uh, got me thinking a lot about the features was this work by um, Devi Parikh and uh, uh, Larry Zitnik um, at CVPR a couple of years ago. So what they did was to take this very successful deformable parts model, and they tried to sort of replace different components of it uh, with humans, okay? And to see how much of a gain that humans would bring over the sort of, the, the current sort of computer um, uh, algorithm for that component. Um, so, for example, this is two different data sets we're looking at here, INRIA and Pascal, and here th there's th they sort of broke the model down to three parts. One, these sort of part detectors, which you think, can think of really as the features. 
then some kind of spatial model, and then some kind of you know, non-maximal suppression between you know, adjacent uh, sort of strong activations on the image. And what you see here is that there was this, um, this plot, and when it's positive, it's showing that when you put the humans in, you've got a, perf a big a performance gain over the existing features. And so you can see there's a particularly large gain here for the features, nothing really too much different um, you know, with the uh, spatial configuration, and then some decent gain also with the non-maximal suppression. So for me, this is really saying that you know, the features here, even though they, you know, they definitely have a vast improvement over what we had before, there's still quite a lot of room for improvement. Okay? So if you put a human in, you get a big jump here of about nearly um, you know, 0.25 average precision, which is, which is a very big gain. And then you know, just looking also at perhaps other work on sort of classifications, this is some work um, by uh, Geller and Norazin. So they, what they did here was to use a sort of, um, an SVM uh, uh, approach where they had a whole bunch of different kernels using different features. In fact, they had you know, 39 different kernels using all the different sort of you know, features that people could dream up. And then they threw it into this big learning framework to then um, sort of you know, figure out which kernels were appropriate to use and how you should weight them. And you can see that they did actually get a very pretty nice gain over some of the existing sort of approaches. This is Caltech 256 here, number of training examples on the x-axis, performance on the y-axis. And um, the, so you know, having more features definitely helps here. Uh, and what's interesting, actually, is that you, know, you get a big jump over the existing methods, and you get some gain from the, um, the actual learning apparatus weighting the kernels differently, but it's not perhaps as dramatic as the gain you get from just the features themselves. Okay, so, so I'm sort of trying to make the argument here that really features are doing most of the work in these algorithms, and so perhaps you know, if we can improve those, uh, you know, we can get better algorithms still. Now, of course, uh, you know, the question is, you've already got 39 different types of kernel here, and computing that on a single image is actually getting really a quite a, to be quite a computational headache. And is there some way we can you know, get better features without sort of you know, ending up with hundreds or even thousands of possible features? Okay, so this then brings us to the whole um, sort of concept of deep learning, which is really what about trying to learn the features themselves rather than trying to sort of handcraft things? And as, well, as I'll explain in, in the following slides, uh, we're going to look really at deep models where we essentially have a hierarchy of feature extractors. You can certainly think about learning the features in, in shallow architectures, but it'll turn out that the, deep, the depth of the model will be important, as we'll see. Um, and if, so if we arrange our, some sort of uh, trainable feature extractors in a kind of a hierarchy like this, where each feature extractor um, you know, takes as input the output from the previous layer, um, then we can actually build a sort of you know, multi-stage model which goes all the way from image pixels up to uh, some sort of high dimensional feature vector or high, or high level feature vector which we can throw into a standard classifier like an SVM and hopefully get nice performance. Okay, and uh, you know, one particular thing we would like to probably be able to do is to train all these layers jointly so that we have you know, some single objective function we're just directly optimizing. Okay, so this brings us on to deep learning. Now, um, as I was saying, it's a really a pretty big field now and I'm, you know, this is a nice, very nice diagram that Marco Aureli Renzato uh, had in his slides and I stole and you can see that he, what he's done here is to sort of divide up this things into sort of deep and shallow unsupervised and supervised and uh, you know this what I'm, we're going to do is really just talk about um, this particular one here the convolutional nets okay so these are um, you know supervised models which can be deep um, they're also worth noting there are other sort of models in that family uh, which I'm unfortunately not really going to go into uh, today now, uh, convolutional nets um, actually have quite a, a, a long heritage. I guess their sort of origins really come from Hubel and Wiesel themselves. So they, you know, Hubel and Wiesel were these um, neuroscientists who discovered, you know, these cells in V1 in the visual cortex, uh, these simple cells as they called them, which detected local features. So you can think that that's certainly a component in all of these, uh, you know, convolutional net models. Um, and then they also found, you know, what they call complex cells, ones which sort of pool the outputs of these simple cells. And so, you know, um, sort of computer science type people started thinking about how to implement this kind of architecture, um, you know, on computers. And so some of the early work by people like Fukushima developed these models which did indeed have this notion of kind of filtering and then pooling. Um, and then Jan LeCun, my colleague at NYU, came along and, you know, in the sort of late 80s, uh, you know, produced these models which, uh, you know, had this kind of architecture but, you know, was, were, were deep. And he showed successfully that they were able to do very well for tasks like digit recognition and so on. Um, and then more recently, you know, other folks have sort of taken derivatives of this, so like you know, Poggio and his HMAX model and things like that. So um, let's just talk about convnets for a moment. So I'm going to use the word convnet sort of synonymously with convolutional neural networks, just because it's much shorter to say. Uh, so this is a picture of Jan, if you don't know what he looks like. 
And this is the kind of model that he was proposing back in the early 80s, late 80s rather. So you can see that you have an input image and then it's essentially a, a, a neural net but with a very uh, specialized topology where each unit in the, in the feature maps connects only to a sort of subset of uh, pixels at the input here rather than all pixels as you would have in a fully connected net. And then there's a whole bunch of these different feature maps which are then pooled um, to create sort of low resolution versions of them. And then this, this is then repeated several times. And then usually at some point, the spatial resolution becomes so small, things can go fully connected. And then um, you have an output layer which produces, in this case, you know, one of 10 outputs, say, for digit recognition. So um, this is a purely supervised model. You put an image in, you get a label prediction out. You're going to compare it to some ground truth label and then use that uh, signal. You're going to push it back through the network to update the weights. Okay, so, sorry, I should have gone to the slide. So this is, you know, as I was saying, it's a purely feed-forward model. You're going to be, essentially, uh, the filtering operation will be, will, is a convolution. You have the same uh, weight matrix applied at each different location. Um, and then we'll, there'll be some kind of nonlinearity and some kind of pooling, which I'll go into later, the details of those. And as the, the training is just going to be this backprop operation, which I'm not going to go into huge detail about, but you can certainly read about in, in many textbooks. Um, like, for example, Chris Bishop's one or something like that. Um, but these are the basic building blocks of each stage, and th this is going to be repeated many times, uh, you, you know, as many times as we have layers in the model. Okay. Um, until, I suppose, the fully connected layers are different here. Um, they're just uh, the layers of a standard neural net. Now, this architecture, you know, when it came out, was very successful, um, you know, particularly with things like handwritten digits. So MNIST is one of the first uh, sort of, you know, really useful um, big data sets that was around, and these models have done very well down the years, and the latest numbers are, you know, still use convnets and achieve you know, errors that are sort of comparable to, or even perhaps even slightly better than humans might achieve on these data sets. And then uh, you know, folks from Schmidt-Huber's lab have also worked on uh, you know, other types of handwriting recognition from other languages, like Chinese or Arabic, and they hold the records for those uh, data sets as well. And then, you know, if we move then on to slightly more complicated types of data, so no longer digits, but simple little benchmarks, maybe like CIFAR 10, which is these little low-resolution images with 10 different classes, or perhaps, you know, street, uh, street sign recognition, obviously very useful for things like, you know, self-driving cars and things like that. Um, the, again, you see that the sort of, you know, these convnets do actually hold the, the record and that they're actually performing in this case, you know, certainly for traffic sign recognition, better than humans do at the moment. But when, you know, when, pe when the first sort of more complicated object recognition benchmarks came out in computer vision, things like Caltech 101 and 256, and when people tried to apply these convnets, uh, they just didn't work that well, okay? And um, I think, you know, one salient pr uh, property of these data sets is that they really had fairly few training examples per class, you know, 30 or so for Caltech 101, and that the models, uh, were, you know, these big convnet models do have a huge number of parameters, and so it's very difficult to kind of fit them to this rather small data set. Now, um, so things changed uh, in the last couple of years because this ImageNet, oh, sorry, for some reason, this, there's meant to be a little picture here which is not showing for some reason. So anyway, what um, appeared uh, in the last couple of years was ImageNet from Stanford, so Fei Fei Li's group, um, and they had uh, this built, have built using you know, Amazon Mechanical Turk workers this huge data set which, with, with labels. So they've taken images from the internet, shown them to Turk workers, and asked them to say, you know, is this an example of a giraffe or is it not? And this way, they've managed to, managed to get about 14 million labeled images across about 20,000 different classes. So finally, we have actually a pretty big labeled data set of you know, real-world images that we can perhaps think about training um, these big uh, ConvNet models on. And last year at NIPS, there was this very uh, exciting paper from the Toronto group. Alex Krzyzewski, Elisabeth Skaver, and Jeff Hinton showed how you could actually take these deep ConvNet models and apply them to you know, train them on this data set and get really very impressive results indeed. So if we just look a little bit at what they did in that paper, um, it was really very much the same model as Jan's uh, model from back in the early 80s. So all they really changed in some sense was the scale of it. So it was a much bigger model. It had eight layers. Um, it had many more parameters, about 80 million parameters or so. Um, and they, can train, they could train those um, parameters because they had the much more data available, you know, millions of images from ImageNet rather than the much smaller sort of data sets which were on the order of 1,000 or 10,000 images. Um, and then they had a very good G GPU implementation to sort of crunch this big model over this huge data set. And they did have a few you know, new tricks, um, particularly ones to do with regular regularizing the model, which we'll talk about later, something called dropout. 
Um, and this is a little uh, sort of diagram from their paper showing the architecture. So they had here, you know, you can see it. This is the input uh, image on the left. This is the first convolutional layer. They actually had five of these. So this is the second layer, third layer, fourth layer, fifth layer. So five convolutional layers. And then they had two very large densely connected layers at the top, for, you know, followed by a softmax down to the thousand classes that were in the ImageNet 2012 data set. And, um, and they managed to train this thing. It took a couple of weeks. And they had to split it across you know, two GPUs because it was so big. This, this, is, this is one GPU up here and the second one down there. However, um, it did work really well. So the, this is the results from the sort of last year's ImageNet competition um, in 2012. These are the sort of uh, leading computer vision groups here. And you can see the errors are all around sort of 26, 27%. Um, but this very big ConvNet from uh, when, you know, when, very ca when carefully trained um, achieved an error rate you know, quite a lot lower, about 10% reduction in error down to about 16.5%, um, which you know, was, a, you know, was really quite a long way ahead of the, uh, of the existing approaches. OK, and indeed, you know, um, the sort of industrial c companies like Google and Baidu got very excited by these results. And so they actually have you know, developed in-house um, this the same, you know, they've re-implemented these models and they actually can now uh, are used commercially for things like, you know, sorting your personal photos. So if you use Google Plus at all, um, there's a way there to sort of search your, your, home, your photos for, I don't know, you know, a, a table or, you know, a, some favorite type of drink or something like that. And it will go through the pictures and, um, and actually return them really based, you know, running these deep components on your home photos. Um, and also Baidu has, you know, has a big um, group in deep learning and they've also implemented uh, these models as well. Okay, so, so we've seen that these deep, com these deep uh, large ConvNets, uh, they you know, formerly were very good for sort of quite simple data sets like you know, digit recognition. Now we've got enough data and enough sort of computation, they've really become viable models for um, much more complicated visual understanding tasks like you know, looking at natural scenes and, and labeling them and so on. So the rest of this tutorial is really going to be about sort of large ConvNets here um, for image classification. We'll also talk briefly about how to use them for detection and, but I wanted to spend a lot of time just talking about how to get these things to work, what's important, and so on. So Alex and Alex Krzyzewski's paper with Jeff Hinton, uh, you know, was, they show these fantastic results, but they didn't really give much insight into why the models work so well or what they're doing inside. Okay, so but before we get into the details, let's just go over the operations that occur in each layer because there are some sort of you know, options there. Um, and then we'll look at the architecture, how you go about training them, and look at some sort of results. So just to go over the sort of components again, we're going to take in pixels if it's the first layer or if it's you know, some high layer in the model. You're going to be looking at features from the previous layer. Um, we're going to be uh, filtering uh, that, that image with, you know, with these convolutional filters, which are going to be learnt. Those are going to be the parameters of the, of the model. And then they'll be passed through some kind of nonlinearity. Um, and then there'll be some kind of pooling. Um, there's a variety of options here. Um, which we'll talk about in just a second. And then uh, optionally, some people have found that some form of sort of contrast normalization operation between the feature responses uh, can help um, in when you're building these deep models. And so just the, the filtering operation here, when each filter is applied sort of independently to the image, and this stage is, is one mechanism for sort of introducing competition between the different channels uh, that you get. Okay? And then this thing gives you some output features, which you can then feed into the next layer of the model and so on. Okay, now before I sort of get into the, go, we go through the details, I just want to make, take a step back and look at sort of successful things from computer vision, and you'll see that they actually have very much the same kind of architecture here. So let's take SIF descriptors, which have you know, proven wildly successful. So what does SIF do? Well, it essentially uh, finds edges at different orientations, so you can think of that as filtering with a bunch of gabors, um, and then it does some kind of um, aggregation to build these little orientation histograms. So you can think of that as a kind of sum operation over some little spatial neighborhood. And then uh, there's also a kind of normalization operation at the end where the SIF vector is normalized to have unit length if it's uh, you know, longer than a certain, longer than a you know, unit, if, if it's longer than unit L2 norm. And so you can see the same operations are present. Um, admittedly, they've had a certain choice here of how they've done the normalization and the, and the pooling and, and the kind of filters they're using. And, but these produce feature vectors which you know, have proven to be very useful for many tasks. And then if we move slightly higher up, you can think about in this very um, good uh, uh, special pyramid matching technique by Svetlana Zebnik and others. So what that does is take in SIF features, and you can think about this technique as kind of filtering with a bunch of visual words. So these are sort of, you can think of mid-level object parts um, that you've perhaps found with k-means or something like that. So you, can, you want to filter the SIF ve vectors with those, 
And then you're going to sort of take a max. You want to find you know, which of these visual words is closest to each of your SIF descriptors. And then finally, you're going to do some quite, uh, in this case, quite complicated pooling uh, you know, at multiple scales within the image. And this representation then you could feed into some kind of classifier. So again, it's got some sort of filtering, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, non, some kind of con normalization operation here, and then some form of pooling. Okay, so I would argue anyway, it's, 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 it's no coincidence that these techniques have proven to be successful, that there perhaps is some underlying, you know, uh, correct you know, formulation that we should try and use. And the beauty about these sort of uh, convolutional architectures is we're going to really train up many of, the, many of the components in here. Okay, so it's true that actually at the moment we don't tend to train so much the contrast normalization or the pooling, but it's certainly conceivable that you could do so. So let's go through the, uh, each of the stages one by one. So let's look at the filtering for a second here. So it, for the uh, data we're talking about, where we're looking at these large high resolution images, pretty much this is going to be convolutional filtering, where you're going to take a little you know, filter and you're going to essentially, it's going to be slid over the image and to produce some kind of feature map. Um, the, the, you're only really looking at a small neighborhood of the input here. That's reflecting the fact that you think most of your dependencies in natural images are kind of local. So you can, you can capture most of the sort of interesting structure just by having a, a, small, a filter with small uh, spatial support. Um, when you do this convolution, um, most people think of convolutions as having, you know, just a, uh, you, know, you, you shift the window one pixel over each time. There are occasions when you might want to sort of speed things up or reduce memory where you might want to have a larger stride. And indeed, in fact, the, uh, Alex Krzyzewski's model did actually use quite a large stride in the first couple of layers, as we'll, we'll look at that in, in due course. Um, and the other thing, of course, to note is that we're applying the same filter at each different location, okay? So we've, you know, the number of free parameters you have with the convolutional type filtering is dramatically less than you would have if you certainly had a fully connected network, um, for example. And that's, that's going to be important. Um, certainly in the early layers, we think that somehow each different part of the image is more or less statistically the same. We can get away with using the same kind of set of filters. Now, at higher layers in the model, that might not be true. You know, you can imagine that, you know, you have sky, you might expect to see sky at the top and, you know, water or ground at the bottom. So you might not want to have this, this um, spatial, the same filter applied to different parts of the scene in the higher layers. But anyway, it's certainly a, a very simple model to implement. And, you know, if you, you're going to have a whole bunch of these different filters and they're going to produce a whole bunch of different feature maps. Um, it's worth noticing you can also uh, think about perhaps slackening off the constraint that you have the same uh, filter at each location. You could think about perhaps, um, you know, having, if you want to increase the number of parameters you have in these layers, you could think about what's called a tiled representation, where perhaps, for example, you know, the, the yellow filter looks at these, uh, these, looks at the image of these locations, which are, you know, sort of essentially big strides offset from one another. And then you might have, you know, the red filter look at these other strides that you see here, sort of, you know, overlapping with the um, ones in yellow. And um, this is one mechanism to sort of, you know, even though you still have, you know, spatially compact filters, to get, end up with more parameters in the layer, okay? And so this, and you can think of sort of generalizations of this um, and so on. So this is, uh, a few people have used these kinds of models, um, you know, these kinds of representations quite successfully as well. All right, and again, you're going to get a bunch of feature maps uh, just like you would normally. So let's talk about the nonlinearity for a second. So uh, the, this is going to be applied uh, to each element in that feature map independently. Okay, there's, there's this point, there's no interaction between the elements in your feature maps. Uh, and this is the whole, the filtering, of course, is a linear operation. And we want to introduce, make these models nonlinear. So when we stack them up, you know, when we have many, many layers, these nonlinearities combined, you know, one unit type in the model is going to be a very, very nonlinear function of the input signal. Now, historically, the sorts of nonlinearities people like for things like sigmoids and 10Hs, these kinds of things over here, I guess the one that's sort of currently in favor seems to be this kind of rectified linear thing that you see here. Uh, I think one reason for this is it massively simplifies the training. You can speed things up a lot because if you essentially it, you either sort of off altogether or you're, when you're on, the gradient of this is just, uh, you know, unity. Also, uh, and therefore, um, when you're doing the backprop, it saves you having to store so much in, um, in memory, and you can um, essentially compute the, the gradients information much more quickly. Uh, it also uh, avoids the saturation issue. So one problem historically with these is once the units, if you have too much input and you're up in these regions here, the gradient becomes tiny. And it's very hard to sort of pull those units back out of saturation, and the model can kind of lock up. But with this sort of one here, that doesn't happen so much. Um, it's also worth noticing that each of the feature maps that we have will have its own bias, and that's, that'll be the same bias across all the different spatial locations in a feature map. 
Um, and that's effectively going to be sort of translating this little uh, nonlinearity to the left or to the right. Okay, so you can sort of change when you, you know, the point at which you want the unit to turn on. So uh, this seems to be the sort of current, uh, you know, current one that people use currently, and it does seem to work better than these other ones people used in the past. Um, that's not to say, of course, that maybe there are some more, more fancy nonlinearities which might work even better that people have, have yet to discover. Okay, so let's talk about pooling for a moment. Um, the general idea is you're going to take uh, spatial neighborhoods of those feature maps we obtained. Um, you're going to define, uh, you know, maybe they might be three by three, uh, two by two, four by four or something. They might be over non-overlapping like this, or they might be overlapping. Uh, and you're going to then do a simple operation on them, like you know, take the sum or take the, the max. Uh, and there's, in practice, most people these days seem to be doing max. Um, you can see you end up with sort of different results here. This tends to sort of blur things out a bit. This sort of, you know, captures the sort of obviously the strongest structure that you see in your feature maps. There is a quite nice theoretical analysis by Ilan Barreau where she sort of compared these two and made some kind of, uh, some kind of theoretical arguments why max is the right thing to do, that it tends to give you more discrimination uh, from your features. Um, you're right, so that was a non-overlapping. You can also have overlapping windows like this. So this, they wouldn't have, the stride would, hit, would hit, be here smaller than the size of the pooling region. Um, now, uh, this is, of course, within a feature map. There are sort of strategies for pooling across feature maps. So one of these um, no, most notable ones recently was something called max out networks, where they're effectively kind of taking a max over sort of groups of feature maps. And they've got some very nice performance with that. Um, I think, uh, you know, so this is a little bit of an underexplored area. Maybe there's sort of smarter things we can do. At the moment, of course, the pooling is just a sort of, you know, deterministic operation that you apply to either within or across feature maps or perhaps both. Um, you could think about perhaps learning some of the pooling operations, but people don't seem to do that at the moment. Uh, so what's pooling actually doing? Well, I think um, the key, the thing it's really giving you is invariance of small transformations. Uh, so that, you know, if I hope these videos will play. Okay, so this is a nice little visualization here from Kwok Lee. Um, this was essentially showing the kind of invariances that you can obtain in the units high up in your model, and you get these kinds of invariances uh, in, in large part thanks to the pooling that goes on between you know, the, a unit high up in the model and the input. And so in this case here, we can see this unit has sort of achieved some kind of sort of invariance to kind of scale. You can see the sort of frequency of this uh, sort of uh, on-off-on type filter is, uh, you know, is, is varying. Uh, oh, sorry, this, the, somebody just explained. The videos are showing directions of change which... Uh, in the input signal, which do not change the unit. So we can see here we can change the frequency in this, of this little gabor, oh, not, it's not really a gabor, this, this you know, on-off-on filter um, at the input, and it's not going to change the, this unit at the, at the high up in the model. So we've got sort of invariance here to scale, and this is another one, but it, this one is got sort of invariance to translation, for example. Um, so, and you can also see, uh, this is some visualizations I'm going to show you in, in a bit, uh, of what's going on in a big convnet. And you can see that, you know, high up in the model, you can get sort of, you know, uh, variations on patterns that all cause that, you know, the same feature map to fire quite strongly. And that's really, again, you know, the, the, that's, the pooling is giving you a large part of that. The other thing, to, of course, to say is that as you go up in these models, that the first layers are just looking at these very small local parts of the image, maybe 5x5, five 7x7, five, seven seven, something like that. Um, but as you go up, thanks to the pooling, each of the units essentially has a larger receptive field looking back at the input. So by the, end, by the high level convolution layers, each unit is really looking at the entire scene, okay? not just some tiny little patch. And of course, that's the kind of property you want to have. You want to be able to learn these much more complicated structures that you know, aren't just simple edges, but actually encode much more complicated patterns that are going to be useful for um, classification. Okay, so, um, so let's look at now a little bit at uh, the normalization the opera, uh, operation. So this is one that, you know, you, it's a little bit unclear whether you entirely need this one. So we can we'll talk about this in just a second, but just, just to look at what goes on. So let's just, uh, the first layer here, we have an input image. Here are our filters. We run our little, you know, convolutions over them. We do some nonlinearity, maybe, and you get something like this. And what we're going to, there's a whole bunch of different ways of doing the contrast normalization, but the, usually what tends to happen is you will pick a single location at the output, and you'll have a little spatial neighborhood around that, in the input that you will look at. So for example here, you might Gaussian weight it or something like that. Um, and then what you'll do is you'll compute the sort of local mean in, these, in, this, in this neighborhood, you know, weighted by the Gaussian. And then you'll essentially, uh, you know, translate, make it so that the four vector here has, you know, zero mean and also has unit variance. So you can compute a standard deviation over this region as well, and of these regions, and then you'll scale everything by the standard deviation that you found in the input here. And what this, and this is, 
the resulting maps that I'm showing over here, you can see has changed in quite a subtle way. So if we go back to this image back for a second here, you can see it was quite dark in this part of the scene, but it's quite bright up here. Now, of course, filtering is a linear operation, so unsurprisingly, you see quite high contrast uh, in the feature maps in that region where we have lots of strong edges, but, it was, but all the feature maps are quite dim in that darker region over there. Okay? But then once you've done the contrast normalization, you can see suddenly the sort of detail in those darker regions is kind of brought out and it's sort of of comparable magnitude to the high contrast, you know, sort of side of the, the hotel or whatever it was um, over there. Okay? And that's, that's entirely happened because of this sort of rescaling effect uh, that you've done by sort of making each uh, little column here have unit standard deviation. Now, the, what I've, the, the version I've described here, it uses, whoops, the version I've described here is essentially um, doing both sort of, you know, normalizing over a spatial neighborhood and across feature maps. Uh, there are sort of different flavors. You might just want to try normalizing within, a, um, within one feature map. So in other words, this guy here would only look at this feature map. Um, there are flavors also that consider sort of, you know, one by one spatial neighborhoods. So just really look at a single column of entries in the uh, feature maps. So, um, and then the other thing to say, of course, is that you don't have to necessarily, there are other ways of doing this other than to have sort of standard, make the standard deviation one. You can use different kind of uh, powers. You might want to take the square root of the elements and divide through by that or something like that. Uh, so uh, certainly Alex Krzyzewski didn't use, and he, he had some contrast normalization in his model, but he didn't use uh, make the standard deviation one for his, in his normalization. Okay, so what's the normalization doing? So it's the only mechanism you really have here for sort of getting the features, different feature maps to interact within a layer, okay? Because the filtering is, linear, is uh, a linear thing that's applied independently uh, for each feature map channel, uh, and then the nonlinearity is just applied element-wise. So there's no nothing there that introduces uh, kind of uh, interaction. And you can think about, I sort of think about this a little bit as maybe one a sort of poor man's version of explaining away that you might see in a graphical model. Um, it's a little bit of a sort of tentative thing. I'm not sure you know, how, how really true that analogy is. Um, it's certainly sort of a local way, of, though, of getting kind of interaction between the elements. I think a much more subtle one is, which might be the reason why it, it does help a bit, is that it would help to sort of rescale the features at each layer. And when you're doing learning, you want to have a sort of isotropic energy surface where the sort of curvature is kind of equivalent in all the different dimensions. And um, this normalization oper these normalization operations do that quite successfully. Okay? So they're going to be sort of adjusting the scales of, you know, the, that you would need at each layer so the scales, they're scaling each layer so that the uh, energy surface is somewhat uh, better conditioned uh, than it was before. And so I think that then means, you see, if you're using a single learning rate for all the layers, that then a, a gradient step tends to make much more progress. So this is one possible explanation as to why this, um, uh, the, the contrast, normalization, contrast normalization does help. So with our experiments we tried, we find it helps a little bit when we're training the models on the image net, maybe in the order of sort of, you know, one or two percent or something like that, which might actually be quite important if you're trying to, you know, get really amazing numbers. Um, there's a much more detailed study of this sort of, uh, of the contrast normalization thing um, by Kevin Jarrett and, and, and colleagues. So this is one of uh, Jan LeCun's papers, in fact, which does, it goes into much more detail on what uh, contrast, no, contrast normalization might be doing. Okay, so it's certainly true that you can get quite good results without worrying about the contrast normalization layer um, in these big models. Now, let's look at the architecture of these models for a moment. And I think the most salient one here, of course, is the depth. Okay, we made a big deal about sort of being deep learning, having many layers of feature extractors. How important really is it? So this is a very simple uh, experiment we did um, where we took, we re-implemented the model from Alex Krzyzewski and Jeff Hinton and others. Um, and this is the, the, the sort of cartoon version of their model. As I said, they had sort of set, you know, seven or eight layers. So they have you know, two convolutional and pooling layers at the beginning, a uh, couple of convolutional layers without any pooling. And then they had a, a final convolution layer followed by pooling before they went fully connected. So these are two, the two fully connected layers. And then they had a big softmax sitting at the top. And so they got um, the, the way that, that people measure the error is this top five metrics. So if the right answer is in the top five uh, responses, so the top five, you know, five units in the softmax, um, then uh, it's deemed correct. And they get 18.2% error. When we re-implemented it, we got 0.1% you know, error better. So basically the same number. And what we did was to try, we're going to, what we're going to do here is to try removing layers within this model and then retraining the architecture from scratch, okay? And then seeing how well it does. So the first thing we did was just try knocking out one of these fully connected layers up at the top. So if you do that, you've just thrown away, you know, reduced the, the model by 16 million parameters. That's a pretty big chunk. And you might think it might, might actually do something bad, 
but actually it turns out not to, just a percent drop in performance. Uh, so, you know, from 16% down to, oh, sorry, this, sorry, this is a single model here that we used. So if, if you average multiple models, they get better, slightly better numbers than this. We'll talk about that in just a second. But yeah, so we're from 18% to, you know, 19% or something. Okay, so what about happens if you throw away both the fully connected layers? You've now just thrown away 50 million parameters out of your model. Um, if, you know, but it doesn't really kill performance. It's still doing pretty well. This is still certainly better than many of the existing computer vision uh, approaches. So at this point, you're thinking, well, you know, what's, this, what's the magic source in this model? So we tried, you can put those ones back in, and you can think, well, what happens if we delete those middle convolution layers? So that's only about a million parameters. It doesn't actually reduce the performance as much as you might think, uh, however. Uh, so, it's, unfortunately, it's hard to remove these ones with pooling because then you kind of completely change the, the sort of the architecture of the model. But one thing, we, the final experiment we did was to then remove, you know, both the fully connected and the uh, those middle convolution layers, and then it really sabotages the performance quite dramatically. And the thing to notice here is really you only have four layers of representation now between your input and your output. Okay, so you st I mean, you still have, you know, you sure you've thrown away lots of parameters, but we did that when we threw away the um, the fully connected layers at the top, and that didn't really seem to hurt anywhere near as badly. So that would seem to suggest that the depth of the network is quite important. And then, so that's one sort of piece of evidence. Perhaps a slightly more, another way of looking at it was, and I'll, I'll come to this uh, later on as well, is we took um, uh, the, we trained up an ImageNet model, we chopped off the softmax at the top, okay, so that we just chopped off this, this layer, because this layer was designed to sort of predict one of the, each one of the thousand classes from ImageNet. So we chopped that off and retrained it on Caltech 101 or 256. Uh, use just, just the top layer was retrained. And then what we could do, then do is just um, tap off um, the performance from each layer in the model. So this is, you know, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, seventh uh, from, from the model, just, uh, and then throw those features into a linear SVM. Sorry, somewhat confusing explanation. We take the ImageNet model, tap off the features from each layer, looking at Caltech images, and then we retrain you know, a linear SVM at each layer uh, to see how well it does. And you can see a very nice sort of monotonic gain in performance here. So you, you know, when you, each layer that we have in the model as we go up does seem to give quite a substantial improvement in the numbers. And uh, so that's another evidence that perhaps you know, the depth of the representation is important here. Um, so one other experiment we did, which just gives you some insight, this is, another sort of insight into what might be going on with de the depth of the model. So this is just showing the kind of invariances that the model can learn, and we're going to look at those more in just a moment. But this is a very simple experiment. We just took in a single input image. In this case, we just translated it vertically. So we're just sliding the image up, and this is the same for some sort of dog. I think this is some kind of crocodile or something, some parrot, and then some TV, or I think it's entertainment center is the label, I think, for that. And what we did is on this plot here, we're looking at features from the first layer. And what we're doing is looking at the sort of uh, some form of distance. I think it was some kind of normalized distance um, uh, between the original feature vector, that is the one you get for sort of zeroed translation, versus the transformed feature vector, that is the feature vector you got from the transformed version of the image. And you can see quite quickly the feature vector changes, right? The gradient here is very steep. Um, but as we move to the high, if we look at the, what goes on at the higher layer of the model, this is the top layer just before the classifier, suddenly everything is a bit sort of more better behaved. We see things are sort of slightly more linear in their behavior. As we, you know, as we, as we translate the image, we don't see such a dramatic change in the feature representation. And then if we look at the classifier output, we see some fairly good invariants. So we can see here that certainly the lawnmower, for example, we still get a very you know, high confidence for quite a wide range here of translations um, of the image. <coughs> Some of the other representations here didn't do very well to start with, but, but uh, you can see for some of these other ones, it's, you know, it's fairly flat for quite a range. Okay, and you can see, but the point is that the input here is very much not in, you know, invariant to, trans sorry, the, the first layer representation is not invariant to uh, you know, translation, but by the top layers of the model, it's actually doing pretty well. And this is the same sort of thing for scale. So you can see here, we're just changing the scale of the image. Um, and again, you know, small scale changes actually make quite a difference to the feature representation. Yeah. Um, but by the upper layers of the model, it's sort of somewhat linearized the whole thing. And again, you see fairly, fairly decent invariance here to, uh, to scale. So this is a kind of invariance argument um, for having, you know, for depth in the model. Um, rotation's a slightly quirky one. So here, you know, you can see that basically a small rotation really changes the signal at the input. You get this weird periodic structure for some examples like the, like the TV here, when it's sort of 
you know, has, an, has a fourfold symmetry, so whenever that lines up, you still get, uh, you know, get a dip in, the, in this feature uh, distance and so on. And then you, correspondingly, you see a sort of spikes uh, for the, the output of the model. And um, so the, the network seems to do a fairly good job of being you know, translation and scale invariant, but not so good for rotation. So we can also um, get more, a little bit of an understanding of what these networks are doing by looking at the, uh, trying to visualize them, okay? And there's been a lot of work on this down the years. And the difficulty really is that the first layer, the filters in your first layer are directly acting on the image pixels. So by looking at those, you really understand what's going, you know, there's a clear interpretation of them. But for the higher layers, they really take just uh, transformations in some sense of the, this, this very uninterpretable, uh, you know, high dimensional feature maps. And they, so the, feature, the coefficients in those high level uh, layer filters are difficult to understand. And so what have people have done a variety of things. One common approach people have tried is to take a single unit high up in the model and then start with some image and do gradient descent on the image to try and maximize the activation of that particular unit. Okay? And if you do that sort of thing, this is the kind of result you get. So this is actually from one of Quark Lee's papers. This is the one where they trained you know, a giant model on sort of you know, 10,000 machines at Google. And, and this, that model was actually trained unsupervised. And they, using this technique, though, they could discover that one of the you know, feature maps was responding to cat images. So they, they did this gradient descent. And that the, the, stim the input stimulus that, max that maximizes the response in this particular unit was this sort of funny image of a cat. Um, the slight catch with this thing is it does enormously depend on the initialization. If you started with something that was completely, uh, you, know, uh, you know, if you started with a car image, for example, it probably wouldn't converge to a cat image. And then you don't get so much of a feel for invariance with this. Uh, so therefore, people, um, people have tried to sort of look at the Hessian around the point you converge to with your gradient descent to get some sort of notion of curvature. And then if you find directions where the curvature is you know, very low, then that's sort of telling you that um, you know, the, the uh, network is fairly invariant, or this particular unit is fairly invariant to sort of image changes on, in those directions. Um, so I'm just going to show you actually a sort of new visualization technique that we uh, uh, used, have used recently, which we found to be quite useful, as I'll describe. And this is actually you know, using a sort of a, a model that we use for unsupervised learning a while ago. It's called a deconvolutional net. And you can more or less think of it as having the same components as a convolutional network, but everything's sort of upside down. So you have, you know, instead of, uh, you're going to start from the feature maps and go back down to the input image rather than the other way around. Instead of pooling, you're going to have some sort of unpooling operation and then a nonlinearity and then some sort of convolution, which is applied to these, uh, you know, unpooled feature maps rather than being applied to the input image, which is what you would normally have in a convnet. And what this is effectively going to give us is a way to sort of map feature maps back down to the input image. So here I'm just showing you the components of one deconvolutional layer. In practice, we're going to stack these up so we can take high-level features all the way back down to the input. Um, just to make the point here, there's no, we're not going to do any kind of, the, in the original papers here, this was a kind of unsupervised learning technique where we had learning and inference. And what I'm going to describe, we're not doing any of that. It's just simply a probe of an already trained convnet. So just to see how that's done, we take our convnet here, you know, we take our input image, compute the first layer feature maps, second layer feature maps. And let's say we want to understand what goes on in this third layer feature map. You know, it's got its corresponding filter here. You know, you're going to get some activity in that feature map. I'm going to take you know, strong single activations from that feature map. So say this guy over here, set all the other feature maps to zero, and, you know, and this one, other elements in this feature map to zero as well. And we're going to use this deconvnet architecture to kind of you know, reconstruct the second layer features, the first layer features, and then uh, a visualization back at pixel space, which will hopefully be uh, interpretable for us. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of exactly how this works. Just You can read the um, paper I have online, how to do it. But it's a way to sort of look at you know, at least how single activations, what they're sort of doing in the model. It's true it doesn't sort of give you any information about sort of the joint activity between different feature maps or things like that. But it does give you know, some useful information, as we'll see. So um, if we, for the first, whoops, sorry, for the first layer, you don't need this at all. Okay? You can just look at the actual filter coefficients themselves. And these sort of ImageNet models, this is the kind of thing you get. These very nice you know, gabors at different frequencies and orientations. And then some kind of uh, low frequency color opponency filters coming out as well. Um, but to do it for the higher layers, what we're going to do is we're going to take you know, an input image, um, compute our feature maps at some high up layer. And we're going to look over an entire data set. So we're going to take, say, an entire set validation set. And you're going to have, you know, for each feature map, you're going to have a different copy of it for each validation image. So there's a whole stack of these. And what we're going to do is to take, you know, the top few activations across this stack and then project back down um, to the input space using this deconvolutional 
um, architecture. And each of these different um, activations will have, um, you know, we, as, we come, as we compute the forward pass here to compute the features, there will be a pooling operation, and we're going to sort of keep around the activity in the, in, you know, we're going to record where the maxes occurred in each feature map. And it's because we're going to need that to, to, in order to be able to compute an approximate inverse operation on the way back down. Okay, so there's more detail in the paper about that. Um, and just to show you the kinds of, um, if we do this, this is the kinds of um, things you get at the first layer. So just to, we'll go to the highlights in a second. So each, this is one of the filters, but this is showing you input patches um, that excite each of the, these different filters here. So this is not using the, this is just simply looking over the whole violation set for image patches that cause strong activity in one particular feature map. And you'll notice, for example, that that little guy over there, that little oriented Gabor, he likes sort of edges at this orientation. So unsurprisingly, you know, if it uh, patches with that orientation, strongly excite that particular feature map. Um, so this is not using our deconvnet re reconstruction for the, at this point. We, we don't need to do it um, for just the first layer. Now the second layer, this is, what, this is using the deconvnet thing. So what we're doing here is for each feature map, we're showing the input pattern which has the strongest activity um, uh, or generates the strongest activity in a given feature map. So some feature maps like long edges, others like uh, circular structures, others like sort of high frequency texture, others like low frequency color, and so on. And you'll see this is a kind of an assembly of those uh, simpler first layer uh, filters we saw. So, so edges are being connected up to form longer edges, and then you've got sort of high frequency texture patterns, which are also combinations. And um, this is just showing the single strongest activation, but we can get a nice non-parametric view on the invariances that we're learning in the model by showing the top few, in this case the top nine. So this, here we're showing for a given feature map, just to be clear, these are not samples from the model. All we're doing here is taking the top nine activations over the entire validation set in that feature map, pushing it back down to the input image using this deconvnet thing. And what it's showing us is the sort of the structures in the input signal that it's actually, you know, responding to. Um, and the, uh, if I, some of these, uh, you know, are a little bit difficult to understand, but if you effectively look at the patches they came from, then you can get a better feel. If you flick back and forth between these, you can see, uh, you know, for example, this one up here, there seems to be some sort of, you know, high frequency vertical edges. And if we look at the patches that they came from, these are in just, you know, it's fluffy sort of fur or something like that. And these are, in fact, the same patches that would cause maximal excitation of that particular feature map. It's just that we're not, uh, the, the network isn't looking at all pixels equally in that patch. It's giving certain, you know, much more emphasis to certain pixels. And of course, the network is trained purely discriminatively. So it's really telling you what are, this is showing you the discriminative parts of the, each of those patches that it's using. So you can see here, it's not looking at the color information or the background. It's just caring about those sort of high frequency edges in that fur pattern, okay? Um, and you can see the same things, that, oops, you can see the same things sort of going on for these uh, circular patterns over here. It doesn't really care about junk in the background. It just likes the circular or sort of concentric type patterns that you see. Okay, so this is the second layer, and you can see we've got sort of these nice um, kind of, you know, mid-level features arising. We can do the same trick for sort of layer three. At this point, you've got starting to get sort of, you know, sort of object parts occurring. Um, this is, uh, and then if we see that we go to the sort of little exemplars, you can see we're now getting some quite complicated invariances being learnt. So if there's quite some sort of grill pattern, or this looks like some sort of zip or something like that. Um, we can see sort of, you know, cornery type structures. Um, I think somewhere there's... It. So if you go back and forth between these two, you can see that they, you know, it's really ignoring quite complicated stuff often in the background and pulling out this sort of similarity between uh, these, diff rather, these different um, input patches. And you can also see this is an interesting one. You can see here this is actually pulling out text. It's, and you can see it's different text patterns that occur in natural scenes are being, you know, uh, essentially, uh, there's a, you know, there is a feature map which responds to text at layer three in our model. Um, and when we get up to layer four, now at this point the receptive field is actually pretty a good fraction of the entire input image. So at this point we're sort of seeing entire objects more or less. Um, hopefully you can see some of these. Though you can, the slides will be online afterwards and you can sort of peruse these at your, at your leisure. Um, so that now things are getting quite complicated. Let's go up to layer five actually. So layer five, um, now we've got sort of little dogs. So you can see this one likes sort of little fluffy dogs, this feature map. Um, over here I think there's a little husky detector on that side over there. And here's keyboards, so you can see this is a, something we, this is, it's learnt rotation invariance fairly effectively. Um, and of course, there, were, it was never, there was no explicit mechanism for that in the model at all. That's something that's naturally arisen. 
of its own accord. And this one over here is actually one of my favorites. This one, I was trying looking at this, trying to understand what on earth it is. What, what is that, this structure? And if you look at the back of the original image patches, you'll notice it's completely ignoring all these rather high contrast, you know, complicated foreground objects. And it's just focusing on the water in the background. So it's like a sort of water detector. Um, and, you know, so this is really showing you how the model is able to kind of uh, very discriminatively pick out structures in the scene. And it's not just blindly firing on sort of high contrast stuff or anything like that. And if you actually if you look at these little dog images, you see this, some, something similar. You notice uh, we've exaggerated the color contrast just to make, to make things more clear. But this is the fact that the tongue here is so bright. That's telling you that that tongue is actually a distinctive feature. So lots of these little dogs have their mouths open with their tongue hanging out. And that is, uh, it turns out that the, the network is sort of picking up on this. And it's put, giving increased emphasis to those pixels belonging to the tongue and the eyes of the dog. And it's kind of ignoring the sort of fur and the background and so on. So what you can see here is actually that these models are picking up these really very complicated invariances that people have wondered for a long time how you might go about encoding by hand. But we're seeing that you can learn them naturally um, without too much within these models. It just seems to sort of arise um, automatically if you, tra you train with enough data and with the right kind of architecture. Now, these visualizations all look very pretty and, um, and so on. You might wonder, you know, are they useful for anything else? Well, it turns out, yes, they are. So we actually managed to diagnose some problems with Alex's model, Alex Grzewski's model, uh, using this, this visualization technique. So in the first couple of layers, they use quite a large stride in their convolution. So if you remember, I was talking about the stride. This is how far you offset each wind where you, when you're doing the convolutional filtering. You don't have to do it every single pixel. You can jump. In their case, they, they jump four pixels. And what we discovered is, in fact, um, you know, if you do use the visualizations from layer two in their model, you've got these strange kind of blocking artifacts that were occurring. And if you uh, reduce the stride to, to say two, for example, then actually the visualization started to look a lot better and you started to, you, those things went away. And it also, um, actually it turned out the first their filters seemed to look a bit, quite a bit better too. We didn't have so many dead filters and, um, and sort of high frequency weird ones. You have a better sort of balance across frequencies and things like that. And they did, so the visualizations didn't just improve, it did actually help the performance as well. So um, this is a table, so this is the, one of, one of the, this was the leading non-convolutional uh, network approach from the 2012 competition, that's the error rate. This was uh, a single model of, of Alex Krasewski's, uh, 18.2, and we implemented got 18.1. And if we change the stride um, using, you know, the, the insights we gained from those visualizations let us change the stride, and we got a fairly decent jump in performance just doing that. Um, so about a percent and a half gain in performance. And then um, if you take, train multiple convnets with the same architecture and just kind of average, then it turns out you do get as usually about a percent or so gain. Um, we also tried, you know, training a slightly bigger model as well with more feature maps in there. And that works slightly better than you know, this one, you get about a half a percent gain. And if you throw these all into, throw that big model in with these five ones, you can see you can actually get a fairly decent gain over, this is the comparable number. So these two rows here, they were training on a much larger training set. So the numbers here, but we can still beat, even though we're training on a smaller training set, by just using a sort of better architecture, you can actually uh, get a better number. And um, that was the 2012 sort of competition. So the, the 2013 competition just happened. So this is a, a, a plot here showing the um, sort of leading results from that competition. Uh, the, 2000, the Toronto group's result from 2012, so this is the one that won in 2012, is shown here. For each team along the bottom, I've just shown their leading result. Many, the, the competition allowed multiple entries for each team. I've just shown the best one. So you can see here there was really been quite a gain over um, the original result from last year. Um, so quite a lot of these, uh, the error's coming down quite nicely. Um, in fact, and the leading one here was, is actually a little startup company uh, by Matt Zeeler, who's the student who did much of the work with this, those visualizations and other experiments. Um, so he graduated just a few months ago uh, from my group. Um, and yeah, the sort of second place person, you can see here now we're down at sort of 11%, which is really you know, a big gain over the sort of 16 and a half we had just a year ago. And if you look at the sort of the progress over the last two years, it's very dramatic from sort of 26 down to 16 and a half, down to 11. So we're sort of you know, carving huge chunks here out of things. Now, you know, uh, pretty much all these approaches are using uh, big, uh, deep convnets. I don't know the exact details from, for, these, for the other groups, uh, I mean, but the, for the most part, the ones that I was involved with, which are in purple, um, they, they're you know, essentially big convnets with just you know, changes to the architecture to improve performance. So there's, not, there's no fundamentally you know, giant new trick in there. 
Um, so anyway, the point is that these, uh, this is really showing these, for classification at least, these models are now achieving very good performance. Okay, so obviously this is a bit, it's a bit unclear what human performance is on this data set, but we'll come to that in, in just a moment. Okay, so now then, just to talk about the more general problems. So those visualizations can be helpful for picking the architecture, but some sort of more general rules to talk about here. Clearly there's a lot of hyperparameters involved with this, like the number of layers, the number of feature maps, the number of strides, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, generally the size of your model is going to be limited by the, the sort of uh, amount of data you have and how many GPUs you can afford and how patient you are. Um, for the most part, you're going to just have to, tr you know, there isn't really a sort of, uh, it's just the same complaint that people made before, that there's nothing really you can do other than sort of cross-validation, you know, typically, uh, to sort of try out different architectures, run them on your validation set, see how they, well they work. Um, you know, the dumbest strategy would just be sort of a grid search uh, approach, um, to, you know, we, but you'll need lots of GPUs for that. There are some slightly smarter strategies. So um, Joshua Bengio and, and James Bergstra had a show that if you just try random configurations, you can sort of much more quickly hone in on the sort of part of, you know, of, of hone in on model architectures that are likely to work well. And there are more sophisticated kind of Bayesian optimization things here that use sort of Gaussian processes to try and make some sort of prediction as to what model you should try next. Um, to, you know, uh, when you, you know, you, or what, what architecture you, you should try next and, and train that up. And then, you know, this, we did manage to get some gains also just by uh, just looking at the, using these visualizations um, from, the, from the existing models we had. So, um, training the big convnets. Okay, so this is a whole, you know, super important part of the whole thing. I mean, generally, of course, the basic uh, algorithm for doing this is backpropagation. So I'm not going to go into the details of backprop. You can find this in numerous papers or books. Um, I mean, it came in in the mid-80s, and that's what really ignited the whole sort of neural net thing in back then. Um, it's more or less, you can just think of it as a chain rule, pushing your uh, gradients back through, you know, updating the uh, weights at each layer, and then, you know, giving gradient information back to the previous one. The, the prevailing sort of optimization algorithm that people use is to cast a gradient descent. So you're going to compute the gradient on just a, s a very small portion of your entire data set. You know, typically, you know, a small batch of maybe 128 images or even less than that. And even though it's a noisy estimate of the true gradient, it turns out that will all sort of come out in the wash and that you can make much faster progress by just, you know, taking gradient step, you know, having just looked at a very small portion of your, of your data. Um, and there's lots, Leon Batu is the sort of pioneer of m many of these things. So he's got a very, some very nice papers on this. So if you look at his webpage, you can find lots of uh, insight into what might be going on and various sort of tricks for making it work well. Um, People have thought about second order methods. Uh, they are, unfortunately, typically a bit expensive. There is some um, work from Jeff Hinton's group, um, uh, James Martin's, uh, where they have looked at sort of ways to try and train these things with uh, using some kind of curvature information. Um, but you know, it, it is much more expensive to, to do than just simple stochastic gradient descent. Uh, one other important thing that, we, that I think a lot of people have found useful is momentum. So this idea that you have a certain velocity uh, you know, based on your previous trajectory, and you should use that as well as your local gradient information. That can help when your local gradients are very weak, perhaps, towards the end of training. Um, there were sort of interesting sort of variants of this. Uh, Ilya Sitskeva had a, a recent ICML paper talking about something called Nesterov momentum, where you kind of swap the order of, in which you apply your um, sort of velocity term and your kind of gradient update. Um, I, for, certainly for classification, the loss function that everybody uses is, seems to use is cross-entropy. Um, for uh, detection, you might want to use some slightly different ones we'll talk about in, in due course. And I guess the other real sort of, um, uh, sort of elephant in the room here is a, G a really good GPU implementation. So Alex Grzewski is an incredibly skilled uh, GPU coder, and it was really his awesome libraries that made it feasible to train these giant nets in some reasonable time. So no matter how, sort of good, how many tricks you have with your optimization, you still should be using a really neat you know, optimized GPU implementation. So we are trying to persuade NVIDIA to sort of actually, you know, support many of these, the functions you would need to implement forward, pop, forward prop and back prop in these confnets as part of their software library. So hopefully, you know, this thing will be now in subsequent generations of the Intel, you know, software libraries, you won't have to sort of worry about too much about this part. Um, okay, I guess, um, Okay, we'll just do a couple more slides and then we'll do a, do, have a little break for a bit and do a demo. So just talk about pre-processing for a moment. Um, it turns out pre-processing your data is actually quite important. Um, the one that certainly you must do is sort of remove the mean. And this is a sort of per image mean. So this is, you know, if each input image, you're going to have a mean across all images in your data set. And you're going to subtract that off and feed it to the network. Okay, so that turns out to sort of give much better conditioning for the overall system, for the training. And, and it all works very nicely. You can also think about removing sort of higher order correlations. 
uh, higher, higher order dependencies rather. Um, so you know, whitening or some sort of ZCA transform, as it's often called, um, is is sort of the ideal thing to do if you want to remove correlations, but it's typically too expensive because it involves computing eigenvectors over your entire image. So if you have you know a million pixel, you know if you have like a hundred thousand pixel image or something like that, you've got to solve you know a hundred thousand by hundred thousand uh, eigenvector problem. So that's usually too expensive for sort of real images, as, we, as you might say. So what's often done is a sort of poor man's version thereof, which would be the contrast normalization we talked about previously in the, in the context of work operating in the middle of the network, but you can also apply it sort of, you know, the, to the input image itself. And so this is, the kind of, this is kind of what would happen if you did that, depending on the, your, the parameters you used. You know, you would essentially have zero in most parts of the scene, but when you have strong edges, then you would have a, either a, a negative or positive um, signal. So, um, so these, uh, so you'll certainly see quite all these, all three of these being used in sort of different uh, deep learning uh, things, and it certainly it can, it can make a vast difference to whether your training is successful or not. Um, okay, I'll do a couple more slides. So, th so, whoops, sorry, this one is uh, actually another very important point. It's a, with the learning rate. So, one of the critical parameters here is the learning rate. That is the step size you take. You compute the gradient with backprop. You need to then decide how far you want to step in that direction. Um, the basic rule of thumb is you should start quite large. If it's too large, you'll find your model will bounce around. Um, I've got that coming up in another slide or two. Um, but what is very important is that you do need to sort of reduce that learning rate. So this is, you can see here, this is training a model. Uh, this is epochs here, and this is error. So you start off with a large learning rate. The model comes down quite nicely. This is test or validation error or something like that, and this is uh, uh, training error. And the uh, gap here is quite... Um, uh, sorry, it, it, it comes down, it's starting to converge, and if you then decrease the learning rate, you can see you now get a huge jump again, in, and the model will, you know, sort of reconverge towards a new lower error rate. And you can do this many times, and sort of the reason I think this is, why, why this happens is that your energy surface that you're sort of optimizing, you're doing gradient descent on, has structure at many different scales. So there are many different, uh, some directions have, you know, very... Uh, large curvature, and then you, you, know, you need a large learning rate to navigate successfully. And other ones are very narrow, and you can't access those sort of narrow dimensions um, until you have a very, very small learning rate. And so once you get down here, you start to see, you know, the, you know you'll start to, start to optimize those other uh, parts of the model and perhaps doing, uh, you know, getting them to really train effectively and ultimately, hopefully, getting a very good error rate. Um, and the, you can actually get a, some sense of this by looking at those feature visualizations I was showing earlier, but now you know, taking a single feature map and looking at how it evolves over epoch. So this is, these are not sampled uh, uniformly. This is like sort of one epoch, two, five, 10, 20, 30, 50, 70, I think, epochs or something like that. And um, you can see the first layer uh, features come in quite quickly. They don't sit, tend to jump around too much. And you know, the second and third one's a bit slower. But if you look at the sort of higher levels of the model, you can see that they only really uh, you know, stabilize and actually start to you know, hone in on something um, really after sort of you know, 40, 50, 60 epochs of training. Okay? So this is telling you that you can't unfortunately get away here with just training uh, you know, for 10 epochs and you know, hoping you're done. You really have to train quite carefully here. And you, I mean, I think you know, part, following on from my previous point about the annealing of the learning rate, it's quite possible that you're only really getting structure evolving here when your learning rate is small enough, okay? And that's why, you know, earlier on you're just bouncing around um, and, the, and these, the filters in these layers aren't really learning anything useful. But of course, you know, in order to learn good things here, the previous layers already have to be converged to something sensible. So it's a, it's a bit hard to sort of isolate the two things. Okay, so I've been talking for about an hour, so just to give everyone a little bit of a break, and in case you want to go to the restroom, I thought what we'd do is just do a little live demo of one of these networks that my student Matt put up online. So hopefully I can navigate this thing. Um, all right. So you can try this out on your iPhone too, uh, or your laptop. So this URL, horatio.cs.nyu.edu. So this is uh, it's one of the components. In fact, I think it's pretty much the model I was talking about that got about 16.4%, I think. On, on the image in 2012. Um, so um, apologies to Android users. We, Matt didn't get the interface work, didn't get the thing worked out quite right. Um, but we can also do it on your laptop. So what we're going to do is just pick a few images here. So if anybody has any suggestions of classes I should search for, shout them out, and I can try running them through the network. And we can see how it does. OK, any suggestions? Bicycles. So bicycles. OK, OK. Nice. Okay, so we can try and find a slight, let's try and find one in a slightly, these are all white backgrounds, which aren't very exciting. Where's Mackay? Sorry? Where's Mackay? Oh. 
<laughs> well, let's try this. We'll try an easy one to start with. So hopefully this one will work. So I, the other thing I should say is that this demo only knows about the thousand categories in the ImageNet data set. So it's completely blind to some very common categories, many things involving people. Um, but I think bicycles is in there, so we can try that. OK, see that? Sorry, there's, I'm sure there's a better way of using this interface, but I haven't discovered it. OK, so we can just blow that. So most of the delay is actually uploading the image to the server. Um, the, thing, the network is actually running behind a sort of clunky MATLAB interface and everything, but the actual network on the, oh dear, is it broken? <laughs> oh no, OK, very good. OK, so this is the result that comes back. So it says moped, mountain bike, bicycle built for two. So you can see there's lots of sort of, you know, uh, it doesn't, there's also these, there's no hierarchy to the categories. So you've got a thousand categories and some of them are very detailed. Um, you, in practice, you want to sort of, you'd like to have a nice hierarchy here. And um, it gives a confidence, so it's 86% confident, which is actually very high, that it's a moped. I think it's getting confused by this sort of fairing on the back here, which is a little bit bigger than you would normally see on a normal bicycle. You can actually help us out. You can then give a little label saying that's actually wrong, that one. I guess it's not really maybe, but none of these are actually, strictly speaking, correct, because uh, it's really just a normal bicycle. I suppose we can give it that. Um, it's not that right either. Tricycle and so on. Anyway, you can sort of t tell it whether it's right or wrong, and then that gives, uh, it gives label information. So uh, we can, does anybody want to try any, any more obscure objects? Giraffes. Uh, sorry? Giraffe. A giraffe. OK, we'll see. OK, it, it may, okay so um, all right, we'll try this one. Now, there is a slight danger, I should say. Is of course, the ImageNet data was gathered from the internet. Okay? So it is possible that some of these it has seen some of these, these images before. But you can convince yourself the thing is not really, it does work by trying your own home photos, which, of course, it can't possibly have seen. Um, so just so sorry, I, I got interrupted. It does actually run in about, if the network of this size can run in a, at sort of like 50 or 60 hertz on a, um, on a, on a powerful GPU. Um, if it's, oh dear, is everybody, if, it slows down if lots of people are submitting to the thing, so this is why, it only comes back within a second or so, uh, but, if, but if everyone is, it's, uh, okay, I'm still somewhat hopeful the network hasn't, the thing hasn't crashed. Oh, okay, so maybe it doesn't know about giraffes, so it's certainly, uh, okay, in this case, yeah. So it's, I mean, you can, it's liking the sort of spotted, you know, fur, I suppose. That's probably what it thought, what I thought was a cheetah or a hyena. But um, some of these other ones. So yeah, so you can see here, it's, it's, when it gets down to these low confidence levels like that, it's usually just not sure what's going on. Okay, so if you, but it does seem a bit split between these two. Okay, that was a, uh, that's, a that's third time lucky. Maybe we can volunteer one. Anybody, anybody else? So do, someone said a chair. Let's try that. Because chairs can, quite, can be quite strange looking. We can try one of those. Okay, let's try and find one not on a white background. Um, okay, too many showrooms. Okay, we'll try that. That's a little bit. So um, there are, uh, Nicholas Pinto uh, from Jim DeCarlo's group, uh, he, he is doing a little startup based on using some deep decomp nets, deep conv nets rather, and he's actually got, showed me one recently, running on his iPhone 5S. So he has one that's doing sort of face recognition. So these models, even though you know, they uh, paint train on your, on your GPUs, once you've got them, they're actually pretty quick. And you know, if you prepare to you know, cut down the model a bit, you can now, it's now just about possible to get them running on a, on a high-end smartphone. And I think you know, the smartphones are getting ever more powerful. So it does seem feasible that we can actually, you know, it won't be too long, hopefully, before you have these things, kind of things running on your, um, on your smartphone. OK. <laughs> it doesn't normally work faster than this, so. Um, come on. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I, yeah, we, it's, this, I should point out this is really like a cobbled together web interface. So you know, it's MATLAB, you know, uh, <laughs> behind the scenes here. So it's, this is possibly why it's a little bit, um, you know, less than professional, should we say? Okay. Well, <laughs> I think everyone else is hammering the system. So. Um, all right. Okay. I think we'll just go back to the slides, and maybe, maybe by the time I'm, I finish with the second part, it'll be done. So. Okay, now um, one thing which is very important uh, with these models is even though we have huge amounts of data now compared to what we had before, it's still really important actually to regularize the model correctly. Um, now the simplest one you, thing you can do is just to augment your data by simply taking very sort of transformed versions of, those, of your training data. So you can take different crops and flips. So this is a trick that Alex Krasowski used and, and, you know, and Jeff Hinton used very successfully. Um, and you know, it's very easy to do. Uh, and practice always works, seems to work pretty well. So you can see this across you know, a wide range of data sets. Just, you know, I mean, this is so, you know, true for other types of machine learning algorithms as well. It's just sort of trying this kind of trick nearly always uh, improves things. Um, weight decay, that can help. So this is just simply penalizing the L2 norm or the L1 norm of your weights in your network. Um, it doesn't have to be, in practice, I think we, we have a very small amount of that. But I guess the, what the most sort of dramatic um, improvement uh, sort of, you know, on useful form of regularization really comes from uh, bizarrely injecting some kind of noise into the network. So this dropout technique by Jeff Hinton um, is one was, they use very successfully and certainly has a big impact on the generalization ability of the model. And there's sort of various uh, refinements, you know, some of my students have worked on as well, which, you know, sort of can also help too under some settings. So, but before I go into the details of these, uh, there's just a sort of high-level point here. You might be saying, well, this is kind of silly. Why, you know, why, oh, the points aren't very visible, are they? Uh, okay, so what, you know, what, why would you, we've got somewhat weird, a bit of a dodgy video connection somewhere. Um, so why on earth would you bother having this giant model and then stressing about regularizing it? Why wouldn't you just, you know, have a smaller model to start with? Why wouldn't that be the right way to go? So I, this is a little toy, hand wavy kind of argument as to why this, so you prefer this one over that. So here's some data. You'll see we have some high density regions with some quite complicated structure in them. And then we have some big empty regions with you know, very low, uh, low density. So very few data points in those. Now if we have a low capacity model, the small model, well, you know, it's going to do a reasonable job of fitting things. It's not going to do anything too crazy in these sort of regions where we don't have any data. But then it's, it's sort of a bit crude in these high density regions. Okay, now if you take your big model, you know, it's got the capacity to do quite a nice job of sort of capturing the structure of those high density regions, but it's also, you know, going to go a bit bananas perhaps in the low density regions uh, because there's no, you know, it's not being regularized in any form. So, you know, there's no data there, so it could do some quite crazy stuff. But the point is if you then sort of, if you regularize the model in the right way, hopefully you can get the best of both worlds, which is to sort of capture the, 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 the fine structure when you have the um, when you have regions of high density, uh, and then hopefully not do anything too nuts in the regions where you don't have so much data. Okay, so that's the sort of the rationale for sort of you know why we, it's important to both have a big model and think about the regularization as well. So just to look at this uh, dropout technique, uh, to, this is something Jeff Hinton came up with. It only applies to fully connected layers in the model, so you can't use it for in, in you can only use it for the final couple of layers in their giant ImageNet uh, setup. Um, it's very simple. All you basically do is take activations at a given layer and randomly s set each element to zero with 50% chance. So you flip a coin, if it comes up heads, you set it to zero. And every time you, for every example, every pass through the data, you flip the coin again. Okay, so you know, it is, you don't, it's not like you keep the same random pattern for, the, for each example. You change it up the whole time. And it, what's it, what it effectively is doing is to sort of mean that only a subset of the model each time can be used to kind of make a prediction about each exemplar. And so, and you actually end up with, a, if you think about, uh, you know, if you just randomly set each um, activation to zero, you end up with this sort of exponential number of different sort of sub-models that are being used. So you can think of this very much as a kind of sort of ensemble technique, uh, perhaps a little bit similar to bagging, except that you are sharing parameters. You know, the parameters in, in the layer are shared across these different uh, sub-models. Um, and you know, this is the kind of result you can get. So this is actually, I think, on some kind of either MNIST or some speech data set, where this is the number of epochs on this axis. This is the classification error. 
And um, you can see that you know, with training without dropout, um, they, after a certain number of epochs, so it comes down, it converges much more quickly without the dropout. That's an important detail. But then starts to overfit, and the, uh, the sort of, uh, I think this is test error, presumably, the green one, um, starts going up, as does the training error bit. Now, with dropout, things, things converge more slowly. Um, but you can see it keeps, things keep going down. Okay? And so you end up with, ultimately with a much lower test error than you would have got otherwise. Now, this, the slowness of convergence is a bit of an issue, I have to confess, when you're training you know, these huge models, and it takes like a week anyway. And suddenly now you're putting in something which slows the thing down even further. Um, but it, it certainly does help the generalization. And, so, and those numbers that you saw um, on the ImageNet competitions you would, would not be achieved without this dropout trick. Okay? So I think pretty much all the models that I know about in that competition uh, that did well were Convnets, and they all used this dropout. So you can, you can think about that was applying a sort of random mask to the activations um, at a given layer. You could also think about some sort of generalization of this. What about masking the weights randomly? Um, so in, you know, some evidence that that might do something. So this is just to show you the kind of binary mask you would apply to each weight matrix. This is, again, in fully connected layers only. Um, this is what you would get with dropout, actually. So each layer here, you're effectively applying a different binary mask. So that's equivalent to kind of masking the weights with this kind of slightly more this kind of low rank um, uh, mask that you see here, whereas that if you do this drop connect technique where you're really masking each weight kind of you know element independently, there's much more sort of randomness here. And it does seem to help a bit. So this is again this is on MNIST admittedly, but this is looking at your cross entropy um, loss um, as a function of epoch, and we're looking here. This is the training. So this is drop out in blue, and and that's without anything. So you can see very quickly it flat lines. Drop out it keeps going down, and this drop connect thing. Um, oh, I'm sorry, it's the other way around, feminist. Okay, well, in this case, it's not working so well, but in some situations, it does. Um, uh, uh, and then another one, so all this, the drop connection dropout are just for the fully connected layers. And you might say, well, you know, but surely the important part of the network is really the, uh, you know, the convolutional part. Um, and so the, there is, the only thing I know that you can do sort of in this flavor is this thing called stochastic pooling, where basically you're going to, instead of just picking the max in each neighborhood, you're going to treat this sort of activities as a little sort of probability distribution and then sample from it. So that, for example, if you had you know, two edges at this orientation in the image, when you run your filter and your, and your rectified nonlinearity, your, fe your feature map would have this kind of structure. This is within one sort of spatial neighborhood, say. So you've got a strong activity here and here. Now, in max pooling, you would just pick this one. Um, in this stochastic pooling setup, you would you know, view this as an, a little probability distribution. So you'd have a sort of 40% chance of picking this element and a 60% chance of picking this one. And each time you looked at this example, you would just you know, uh, you know, pick, pick a random number and, you know, if it, and, and see, randomly pick you know, one of these two according to their probabilities. And you know, in this case here, we, you know, it came up for location one rather than location nine. So uh, you're going to pick this element here. And in training, this, if you do this in training, then it works very well. So all these stochastic methods, so I should have put this on the slides, um, are really applicable for training. At test time, you don't want to have noise in there. It kind of screws things over, and you have to do some kind of, um, I, some kind of uh, can, you know, waiting, weighted thing. Or I mean, technically, the right thing to do is to sort of apply the noise and average out, you know, over many, many different, uh, you know, n different noise trials. But that's too slow typically. Um, but anyway, so these techniques can work well. This is just showing here what on CIFAR 10 uh, epoch error. Um, so this is showing average pooling, max pooling, stochastic pooling going on. Uh, this is a three-layer network, I think. And you can see this is the interesting curves of these ones. These are the test curves you really care about. So you can see that um, average pooling and max pooling kind of flat line, but the stochastic one keeps going down and so on. So it does, it does slow convergence still, so it's, it's slower to converge. Well, actually, no, it's, it seems to still actually do a bit faster on this plot anyway. Okay, so that's, um, those are sort of uh, some different types of regularization you might want to try. Uh, there are some other sort of you know, tricks. So these are Marco Aurelio and Zato had these, some nice slides, which I've borrowed. So um, one obvious thing is when you're implementing your backprop, you know, make sure it all checks out numerically, OK? Because so, it's pretty complicated to do. And you know, if there's any screw up, you can, in the actual implementation of your backprop function, you can find that with just doing sort of finite differences with your forward prop. Forward prop. Of course, if you mess up your forward prop too, then you know, you're in trouble. But at that point, you should you know, uh, be more careful. So uh, one thing you can also do is you can look at the feature maps. Now, this is more, more uh, looking at it from, is it, for the convolutional ones, they will be 
2D. In this case, I'm just sort of vectorizing them into sort of 1D. So for each data point, you're getting a, you know, a, a vector, a row vector, rather, for each um, feature map. Um, yeah, sorry. Let's just think about this for a fully connected lab for a second. It's just easier. The point being that all, you should be seeing that your units are sort of uncorrelated and high variance. Right? This is the sort of healthy looking stuff. Um, that, you know, your hidden units should be firing sparsely, both across samples and across features. Um, if, if you look, see something like this, that, that's not good, okay? Because that means that um, you see, you know, there's a lot of strong correlations here. Somehow, that you know, the network isn't doing the right thing. Um, so that's one little sort of debugging operation. Um, and then the, there's, you know, if the th if you've tried, you know, if you've tr implemented everything, you've, your numerical gradients are checked out, still not working. There's a whole bunch of things you can check, look up for. So one thing will be, does your training diverge? So that is just, I mean, if you don't actually reduce your loss function at all, um, maybe you set the learning rate too large and things just bouncing around and the energy surface is not able to descend. So that would be a clue that you should reduce your learning rate. Your, yeah, or your back props buggy in which you should be able to find that with numerical gradients. Um, if, you're, if you do minimize the loss, but your accuracy is pretty rubbish, maybe you've got the wrong loss function. Um, maybe there's some sort of degeneracy with your model in some way. So. Um, I mean, for the classification at least, oops, uh, that shouldn't be, I mean, it's fairly clear what the loss should be and the model architecture, I don't think there are any strong degeneracies in the things I've been talking about. Um, now, uh, if, you're, you know, if, if, you're, if your loss does decrease but it still doesn't work very well, uh, one thing, maybe you don't have a big enough model, so it's certainly true that bigger models generally equate to better performance, so you could think about trying to um, just make the model bigger, um, if, assuming you can afford it in terms of number of flops and parameters. You could try uh, you know, visualizing the number of things inside the model. Maybe there's some kind of um, optimization issue going on and so on. The truth is, you know, this has always been a bugbear of these, uh, these models. Is they're just difficult to get working. And so I think one you know, good test would be you know, take Alex Rozevsky's code on his web page, try getting it working for CIFAR 10. That's a very simple thing. And then you know, try re reproducing his results for the full image net and then use that as a sort of uh, starting point rather than trying to sort of start do things from scratch. But if all things go well, um, these are the, some results that, uh, you know, from Alex's um, paper, in fact. So this is the kind of results on ImageNet. You can see here that uh, this is the, these, the uh, validation set images. This is the um, true label, I think, and these are the five top five predictions. This is, um, it's, it's in red if it's correct, and it's... Uh, yeah, the red, yeah the, red, the correct answer is shown in red and the other ones in, in blue. And you can see oftentimes it does, you know, pretty well even though it didn't, you know, in this case, how you may know that's a lens cap. It's very confusing. Um, so you can see some nice examples here. So this one is an illustration of kind of some of the shortcomings of um, trying to do object, you know, just classification where you're trying to give a single prediction for a given image. And this is, you know, in some sense a little bit crazy. So in this case, you've got cherries and a Dalmatian and the model picked Dalmatian, which is not, you know, probably what I would have gone for, but apparently the, the true label there was cherry. So, um, so it's certainly true that probably, you know, human performance on these data sets isn't going to be 0% um, error either. Okay, so let's talk about object detection for a bit. So we've talked so far about, you know, just try, trying to predict, you know, the single label for the image. Um, the, uh, you know, what about trying to localize? So this is the kind of thing we'd like to do. You know, you want to be able to put a bounding box around the different objects within the scene. Um, this is something which, you know, uh, is, is a lot harder. There are many more possible wrong answers. There's a whole num you know, think how many possible bounding boxes out there are in this scene, and only a very small subset of them have an, a decent overlap with the ground truth bounding boxes, and therefore would count as a right answer. Okay, so just to get a, f now, one uh, sort of thing many people perhaps thought when they looked at those classification numbers was maybe the network was just, uh, you know, using some sort of general scene context to get the right prediction for classification. So what we're going to do here is a little fun experiment um, where we're going to take a little gray occluder, okay, this little gray square, and we're going to sort of run it over the image. And at each different position of the gray square, we're going to pass the, the occluded image through uh, a classification network and monitor how the unit f for the correct class varies. Okay? Now, if the network was sort of using entirely um, you know, contextual information, then you know, it, shouldn't be able, it shouldn't be sort of you wouldn't expect to see that much of a difference when you block the actual object, but if, you, if it really understands the, you know, the object in question, then when you cover that up, 
and in some cases the object's quite small, so it will directly be under the square, then you should expect to see quite a big attenuation in, the, in that output unit. Okay? So this is just sort of showing you, you know, the more general question of, you know, do these networks ex you know, internally ha understand what's going on in the picture, or are they just doing some sort of large-scale kind of aggregation? So this is a little example. The two labels Pomeranian, it's kind of a type of little dog. Um, this is our gray square, so you know, the top left element here corresponds to putting the gray square in the top left and pushing it through the network. And you can see for most positions of the gray square, the network is very confident it's a Pomeranian, 0.9, but when the gray square is on the little dog's face, suddenly it attenuates quite dramatically down to, in this case, 0.1 or 0.2. So in this case, the network has really understood that, you know, it has to, you know, this, this little dog, this little face here is what it's using to sort of predict it's a Pomeranian. And one little funny quirk is, if you notice, it, this is showing the most probable class across the thousand different op options. And so here, when you put this um, over the dog's face, it, it therefore just leaves, in some sense, this tennis ball. And it does indeed say tennis ball when the, when the square is in the right position. So it is, is able to sort of pick apart different parts of the scene. Um, you can, this is a more sort of complicated one. The true label here is car wheel. So you can see uh, when you use the gray square on the wheel, um, you can see a, quite a dramatic attenuation in this part of the scene. And actually, it slightly improves when you block out this text, which it seems to get a bit confused about. Like it thinks that might be important. Uh, this, was another, this is another example of, this, of where you have a dog and two people. If you, if you mask out the dog, you can see here a fairly good indication that, in fact, you're looking at a dog. Uh, sorry, it dramatically drops the, the probability of Afghan hound. But if you block the people's faces, it's then less confused about whether it's going to be saying something to do with a person or a dog, because obviously it's a bit ambiguous for us what, what the single label would be for this image. So if you block this person's face, then actually it improves the probability of it being Afghan hound. Okay, so these models do internally sort of, you know, are picking apart sort of what's going on here. Um, so this is a kind of, the kind of architecture you might use for classification. So what I'm going to talk about now is how you might use this for a detection problem. And um, the basic idea is that most of these, the, in the classification setup, you have a sort of single input window size, 224 by 224, and you're going to downsample your image, input image to that size, or you might do some downsampling and cropping so you don't mess up the aspect ratio. Um, and then you're going to, you know, you can think of this as a giant sort of feature extractor. It's going to push that through. And then this layer here, the top conv layer, you're going to get a 6 by 6 feature map spatially by 256. And, and then you're going to pump, push that into your classifier, which is going to give you your uh, vector here, you know, over, say, 1,000 classes for ImageNet. Now, <clears throat> if, what we're going to, in, in detection, what we're going to do is to really sort of use this thing as a, in a sort of sliding window fashion. So if our image was now, say, you know, 240 by 224, then there are sort of two different positions we're going to stamp down our little uh, input window on. Okay? And for each one of those, you're going to get a, uh, a, a little... So you're going to end up, sorry, when you apply the network to this input thing here, you're going to end up with um, a 6 by 7 output maps at layer 5 um, with still 256 features. And the, I guess the key point here is that you're not you're not just stamping the thing down in two separate locations. You're treating it, you're just going to take the filters and all the pooling and so on, and you're just going to apply it in one single pass, okay? So you don't need to sort of, you know, recompute everything from scratch for the two different positions here. It's just going to be one continuous thing. So it's going to be an hour 240 by 224 image in, and that's going to give you a sort of six by seven thing out. Now, of course, um, that, that you have to, uh, you know, because of the pooling and, the, uh, and things like that, uh, and the strides and in the, in, in the convolutions and so on, you're actually going to, you know, a, a single pixel extra at this map corresponds to a, quite a big jump at the input back here, okay? Um, and then those two, uh, each for each, you can think of the classifier here as being something that looks at the sort of six by six neighborhood of, the, of this final layer feature map, or this, sorry, fifth layer feature map, and produ therefore produce two different uh, input vector, two different output vectors, so one red and one white. Uh, so corresponding to, you know, what's going on in this position of the input image and what's going on in this position of the input image. Now, so this is how you would do it at one, for one sort of, you know, just how you would deal with the, sort of the sliding window aspect of things. So you're only going to end up now, this is just, of course, doing it in one dimension, considering a one-dimensional change to give you a sort of, uh, you know, a two-pixel by C 
output, the C being the third dimension. But you could, of course, apply this in a 2D fashion, right? So you're going to trans, you know, if the image was now larger in this extent, you would now have, you know, a, you know, a grid of these C-dimensional vectors at the output. Um, okay, so this, but then, of course, we're also going to do this sort of, oops, sorry, going to do this from multiple scales. So you take your input image, you're going to form a little pyram image pyramid like this. For each one of those pyramids, you're going to compute a whole bunch of different feature maps. And each one, then, you're then going to, oops, sorry, you're then going to, um, have a sort of you know a, a grid here of c-dimensional uh, vectors in the third dimension, um, and then you're going to have that for each of the different scales. Okay, and so hopefully you know when you're looking at say the boat class, hopefully there's some sort of hotspot you know in this maybe at this scale in this particular location. Okay, so that's um, telling you that when the, the sort of receptive field is in this location, um, you know it's fairly high confidence that it's a boat. Now of course it's going to not just going to be in one map; it's going to be over several. But just for illustration, let's just go with take a single activation for a second. So what we're going to then do is you can then t what we're going to do is tap off the features of that position. Okay, so this is a 256 dimensional vector at this particular scale and location. All right, and then what you're going to so it's that thing in that red vertical thing, and what you're then going to do is to then uh, train up a sort of separate network uh, on top of this, taking this as input, which is going to do regression. So, so it's going to go from this 256 dimensional vector to a four vector, which is going to be basically the sort of extent of this bounding box for where you think the boat might be. Okay, so in this case here, you can see it's a bit off, and this is the green ground truth. And you're going to have some loss function that's going to penalize the difference between these two boxes. And there's a variety of choices there. You could use some sort of simple squared, sum of squared differences on, the, you know, on these four coordinates, or perhaps you could do some more fancy one like intersection over overlap, which is actually going to be your evaluation metric or something like that. And you could back, back prop that error to train up this regression net. Okay? And if you're feeling really ambitious, you could also perhaps think about you know, uh, pushing back through the rest of the network too. So that's um, a little bit how it's going to operate. Now, so therefore, each different sort of position we saw back here, you know, with a high confidence, is going to produce for us a bounding box. Okay? And, then what's, and, but, and as I said, this is just one location. You're actually going to have a whole bunch of these things. So, um, this is the kind of output you're going to get. So you can see here we've got you know, different scales, and we also treat the flip here as a different sort of version of the image. And for each sort of high firing you know, uh, at, the, at the output map, where we have a high confidence um, you know, in, the in the output pyramid, that's going to produce then a, a bounding box prediction. And you can see that these are the multiple bounding box predictions we get across different scales and across different um, you know, uh, also the flips as well. And then the final sort of prediction will be some sort of you know, aggregation of these bounding boxes, taking into account the different confidences you have for each one, okay? Because you, know, you will have a different, uh, each element in this class map will have a different confidence, okay? So you know, maybe you're more confident uh, w when you see it at the right scale than you are at you know, these other scales that are a bit different. So this is, um, this is actually a, a, one of, a paper with uh, Pierre Sermonet and Jan LeCun and myself uh, that's under review at the minute. But this is the kind of output you get. This is the, uh, uh, ImageNet detection challenge that was new this year. So this is the, the kinds of complicated images that they have. You can see there's a lot of uh, labels, and it, you know it's getting you know some of the objects right. Um, some of the labeling is a bit wacky. So you know in this case here, the ground truth just labeled the a bowl and the microwave. Our network actually outputted you know a fridge for this one as well as the microwave. Which, you know that is actually a fridge. So you know even though it was a correct prediction. It's, not, it's unfortunately going to be penalized because it wasn't in the ground truth. Um, but you, you can see that uh, it's able to handle sort of objects of quite different size. And um, you, know, you can certainly now have you know, many different uh, bounding boxes per scene being predicted. Um, this is another little example here. So you've got in this case, you know, this is the ground truth. Here we're predicting you know, person, miniskirt, TV monitor or something. Um, and um, these, the, I think the. Uh, the competition, the, the sort of leading approaches were all around about 20% average precision. So it was quite, you know, quite a difficult data set. And I think, I think I'm correct in saying all the leading approaches used ConvNets in some shape or form. Uh, I don't know exactly the details because uh, the people they haven't made public what they're doing precisely. Um, people have in the past, actually, uh, this, this is more recent approaches to doing it. Uh, there's also been, has been work on sort of using uh, ConvNets for pedestrian detection. It works pretty well. Interestingly, this is one of the few settings where an unsupervised pre-training of these components can really help. So most of the time, things I've been talking about here is everything's being purely supervised. Having some kind of unsupervised um, thing can be kind of useful too. Uh, it's a bit hard to interpret these curves. You're basically looking between 
if you train purely supervised, you're on the solid red one, I think. And if you train unsupervised beforehand and then refine supervised with standard back prop, you move down to this dashed one here. And so you want to be in the bottom left corner for this, for this plot. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about the feature generalization. So these networks, you know, we've shown they have nice results on things like these ImageNet data sets. You know, is this going to help us with other vision tasks? Um, so the paradigm that I uh, is basically you're going to train your model on the big ImageNet data set. You're going to chop off that final softmax layer, retrain to whatever data set you're interested in, and see how well it does. Okay? So this is um, some work uh, by uh, Trevor Darrell and from uh, their, their DCAF group. There's DCAF, I think, they, as they call it. So this is Caltech 101. This is one of the leading, uh, I think, approaches, uh, sort of vision approaches, this Yang et al. And this is what they got with their um, Convnet as they just as they did this. Okay, so they can you can get improved. Um, they, they use two different classifiers: logistic regression or an SVM, and they got slightly better perf performance with an SVM here. But you can see, it's, first of all, it's oh, with, with 30 training images. It's it's I think it got has the best performance. Um, or better performance than the existing approaches, and um, it certainly d picks up much more quickly. So then, you know, even with five examples, it's already very competitive. Um, so this is something we had. Uh, we we also ran on Caltech 101, but this I'll show you the 256 plot. So these are two sort of leading approaches on 256. Um, this is the number of training images per class here, and uh, this is the curve we get from the ConvNet. Okay, so you can see the final, you know, much better final performance, and with just six training examples you're picking up very quickly. Now, you might be tempted to say, well, isn't, it, isn't this a bit unfair? Because you, know, you trained on millions of images beforehand to get your feature representation, and these guys were just training on uh, this data set here. Well, I mean, the slight counterpoint to that is all those hand-built feature detectors weren't just designed you know, in the abstract. I mean, people used images to actually design those features as well, but somehow you know, people don't count those as sort of technically training images. Um, just to show you uh, what happens here with um, uh, if you don't pre-train, if you don't use the ImageNet data to train your feature representation, you just try to train your giant ConvNet just on Caltech 256, it all goes horribly wrong. So as uh, you can see, you're getting some terrible performance that's way worse than sort of the leading approaches. Um, but if you, you know, pre-train on the ImageNet and then just, just retrain that final softmax classifier, um, you know, there's a vast improvement. Okay? And you can see that you know, the numbers here are really quite substantially ahead of the existing uh, things. Um, and what about doing uh, detection? So this is a little case where the Berkeley guys, uh, they did some sort of vision stuff to you know, take an input image, propose different bounding boxes and, uh, you know, that might possibly contain an object, and then, then use a sort of standard uh, you know, convnet for classification to then say, you know, is that a person or is that a you know, horse or whatnot? And using this quite simple approach, so it's basically, you know, the Alex Grzewski's model here, they didn't really change that at all. All they did was just combine it with this kind of bottom-up uh, possible object proposal. And then they did get a really nice gain in average precision over um, the previous sort of state-of-the-art things based on deformable parts models and so on. Okay, so now I've talked a lot about sort of data sets uh, and you know, impressive numbers of these continents. I mean, one very curious question is how are these things doing in absolute terms compared to, say, us or perhaps monkeys? So this is a very cool paper that um, if you want to hear more about, you can go to um, Jim DiCarlo's tutorial in the afternoon. And this is where they, what they did is they, had a, they created a data set here that was of their own, you know, it consisted of sort of natural scenes with one of, I think, seven or eight different classes uh, of synthetic objects superimposed. So you can see cars here, and they would vary the illumination and the orientation of the car <laughs> and so on. Uh, and this is just some examples. And they would present these images to monkeys, okay? Who, would then, who had electrodes implanted into IT. And that's part of the sort of visual cortex quite high up relating to uh, object recognition. And they would tap the, the, the signals that would come out of these, this electrode array. They would regard as a feature vector. And they could then plug that into a linear SVM. But then they could also take, um, you could take the same images, show these to the deep neural nets. Okay? So obviously the deep neural nets weren't trained on this data. They're just being shown these as test examples. And then you can take the feature vector from the, just before the classifier in the deep neural nets and then use the same classifier that you used for the, for the monkey uh, feature vector, as it were. Okay? So the key point is you've got the same input image, you've got the same classifier on the end. All you're doing here is sort of comparing feature representations, one produced by these deep neural nets and the other one produced by uh, the monkey's brain. Um, and they also had, a, a, had humans in there too. So this is the sort of uh, slide. So this is how well humans do on this task. 
Now, it's done in this rapid presentation mode where you only show the image for a tenth of a second and then you have a mask. And this, it's, this is a sort of psychophysics trick to ensure that you're, you're supposedly only using feed-forward computation in your brain or the monkey's brain, and there's no time to do sort of more sophisticated top-down reasoning. So if, if you were given sort of unlimited time to look at these, you would surely probably be you know, in the high 90s of percents. But because you're only seeing it for a short duration, um, you're really just looking at it for, um, you know, you can see people are getting here about sort of, um, well, it's about sort of uh, about 76, 77% accurate. But there's quite a variation here um, in, in people. So some people are good and some people are bad. Okay, um, and then you can take the monkeys. So they put the, uh, took the feature representation from V4. Now, of course, they can't record all the neurons in V4. They're just looking at a subset, but they have some way of statistically extrapolating. So this is how well they think they could, the V4 representation would do if you could look at all of it. Um, and then the same for IT. So what's quite interesting here is that they're sort of predicting that the prediction is fairly comparable to what humans would get. And that, you know, it seems like monkeys are about as good as recognizing things as we are. So this is, you know, because some confidence their prediction is reasonable. Okay, so then what we can do is then compare this to the deep algorithm. So if we just try V1, um, so this is Gabor's, I suppose, with some kind of pooling going to the SVM. It does pretty poorly. So chance level performance here, I think it's seven categories or something. So it's like chance level performance is about 14%. So chance is along sort of at this level. So it's only a little bit better than chance. If you, this is um, Poggio's HMAX model. Um, this was uh, Quackley's model, which was essentially mainly trained on supervised and then refined supervised. Uh, this is one that came out of ICML, so these things are all you know, improving in performance. This is the result from the big convnet, trained purely discriminatively. This is you know, Alex Ruzewski's thing from NIPS last year. Look at that huge jump. It's almost up with humans, and you know, those few changes I mentioned for the, uh, on the stride and stuff like that do actually give you a bit of a gain here, which bring you kind of comparable to humans. Now, of course, you know, this is a slightly weird data set, but you know, these, none of these models were trained, or indeed humans or the monkeys were really trained on this data. Um, so, uh, so it's all sort of a, a test time, as it were. Uh, and of course, you know, humans get to use top-down reasoning, which none of, these none of these models really have any of that. So that's something, obviously, a big open problem for the future that we'd like to figure out. Okay, so I'll just, I guess, sort of wrap up. So anyway, the punchline is that these deep nets do seem to be doing pretty well in, in absolute terms. Uh, they really you know, are perhaps, you know, and certainly in more limited domains, uh, you know, this is obviously a sort of intermediate domain where you have seven classes or something. But in more limited ones, like you know, recognizing house numbers, the deep nets are actually probably better than uh, humans. And certainly Schmidt Huber's got lots of results from his group on things like you know, road sign recognition and so on, where they are beating humans as well. Um, so we just talk about some other applications. So people have used convenets for seam parsing. Um, this is uh, Clement Farabay's uh, work. Um, also looks at some work to do with video. People have done that a bit. There's also quite a nice work on, uh, so Sebastian Sung has this connectome project where they're taking slices of the brain and trying to you know, trace neurons uh, throughout this 3D volume. And they use actually deep convnets to be able to sort of segment this tissue that they see under the microscope. Um, there's some, several papers on that. And the, the best uh, deep nets are very effective at this uh, task. Um, there's also you know, work on sort of uh, you know, disease detection under slides as well, where you're looking for these sort of funny, funny patterns. Um, then there, uh, people have also used them for sort of much lower level problems within vision. So in this case here, you can actually do denoising using a neural net, which, and it turns out to be very competitive with these sort of state-of-the-art uh, techniques that people already have uh, going on. So you can see uh, the output here is, is very comparable in dB to the uh, state-of-the-art. Um, this is another slightly wacky one that we, we, one of my students and I did where you're trying to remove like dirt or rain, perhaps, f from um, an image. And the network, you know, just with a single image, you, the thing can sort of figure out what a raindrop or a piece of dirt looks like and just remove it fairly effectively from the picture uh, and so on. Um, OK, so I'll ju I'm just wrap up and then we can take questions. So what, you know, where, should, where should we look in the future? Because things are working pretty well for you know, static images. Well, I think video is obviously one that we should all think about. It's a real headache from an implementation sort of systems point of view. I think trying to uh, sort of combine uh, you know, deep learning with some kind of structured prediction. So you know, these sort of stochastic grammars that people have been thinking about, some of these sort of you know, parts and structure models, perhaps you could you know, interface these with feature, you know, deep feature extractors and do cool things and so on. So, just to finish, so I think uh, Jan LeCun, I would say, was right after all those years. He, the, many of us, myself included, didn't really believe him that confnets were going to be the final solution for stuff. 
Uh, but I would say that they are working very well, at least for these tasks. And it's, obviously, they're not the solution to everything. We still have no um, sort of top-down mechanism in these models at all, and undoubtedly we need that. But um, they do seem to be certainly very effective, and they are you know, difficult to train, but once you have them, they can work very well, be very efficient. So if you want to try that um, demo out, uh, that's the URL again. Um, you can just have, have a play with it and see how it goes. So I'd just like to thank a lot of my colleagues at, at NYU. So Matt Zeal has done a lot, produced a lot of the experiments uh, that you saw. Um, and also David Eichen and Pierre Sermonet, they worked on the detection. And of course, Jan and Marco Aurelio Ranzato was very graciously let me use some of his slides uh, and so on. And for the funding, uh, people I get money from, thank you very much to them. And so one final thing is just a plug for uh, this conference, so if you're interested in deep learning or indeed any kind of representation learning, this is happening in uh, Banff next year in April. The deadline is scarily soon, uh, December the 20th. So that was, this is the second year we're doing it. Last year was very successful. We had a lot of interesting papers. So if you do have anything you think might be suitable, please do submit. Okay. Thank you very much, Rob. That was a superb uh, tutorial. We have about 10 minutes or so um, for questions. Perhaps I can just be cheeky and ask the first sure. one, though, just yeah. to sort of pick up on your final point about unsupervised learning. I mean, something like, you know, 98% of your tutorial was about supervised training of deep structures. And, and I guess it's fair to say that the sort of resurgence of interest in these structures came actually from uh, layer by layer unsupervised yeah, uh, feature right. discovery with the restricted Boltzmann machine. So do you want to pick up a little bit on the relative merits of these approaches? Yeah, right. So I, mean, I would dearly love for the unsupervised learning to work better. But I think the harsh truth is that whenever you train, whenever we train the unsupervised models, you know, they never work quite as well as the, the, the fully supervised ones. And we've tried, you know, obviously we try combining the two, um, but it all, sort of, it all seems to go badly wrong. I mean, in the sense that the, the, the uh, unsupervised model seems to care a lot about reconstruction, because that's really what's the important term in the loss for that. And then if you, you know, the classification, the feed-forward part, seems to care a lot about predicting the right label. It's hard to get the two things to sort of behave well with one another. And so, I mean, personally, I think, I think something's kind of missing from the way we're thinking about it. So maybe, I mean, my, my bet is that video is, some, is part of the, the equation there, probably, that we should be thinking about maybe using video to do the unsupervised learning. But, um, yeah, it's disappointing that they don't work better because it seems to be like this, the, the true answer must involve unsupervised learning unquestionably. And that's clearly missing from things we have at the moment, I think. So. Okay, great. Um, so this is being videoed. We'd like to capture the questions. We don't have sort of the usual um, microphones <coughs> in the aisles. So if you want to ask a question, if you could speak very clearly, maybe Rob could just summarize the question, or if he doesn't like it, he could change it slightly and <laughs> answer a different question. Um, so who'd like to ask a question? Don't be shy. It wasn't, a, oh, there we go, yeah. Um, well, hold on. I mean, we, we in, sorry, okay, the question was um, when we saw that deep nets were better than humans in some situations, um, the ground truth came from humans, so they should have 0%. Yeah. All right. So, uh, I, I mean, it's a little bit confusing because this, this, this slide I showed here, um, I mean, the humans only got to see the image for a tenth of a second. Okay, so uh, you do make some mistakes in that setting. I mean, you know, you don't always get it right, and that's because you can't really use feed forward. And, or, or you weren't paying attention and stuff like that as well. Um, and that's, um, so this is why the, the, the human performance is very low. I mean, of course, you know, I mean, they concocted these images themselves, so they do know what the true answer is. I mean, these were synthetically generated. You actually had an example, I think, earlier in the talk, just, just standard uh, recognition, where um, I think the human error rate was about 1% and the, and the um, deep neural net was about half a percent. So I suppose, I suppose uh, the question there is how... You know, is this, is this a variance in, in human labeling, essentially, that you're talking um, about? Yeah, so well, I think this, is, this gets an interesting point. So for sure, like the traffic signs, I mean, um, I mean you can, if you have many humans labeling, um, I mean, if you, if you average their uh, labels, then you should re hopefully reduce the human labeling error. I mean, there's two types of error, right? Well, ones where the humans were, just weren't paying attention and were absent-minded, but other ones where maybe it was genuinely ambiguous, so and they got it wrong. So obviously, the, the first type, the averaging pr procedure will help with, the second type, it's, it's not clear so much. I mean, it'll help a bit, but not as dramatically. Yeah. Uh, I can answer this oh. uh, question. This is
Mm -hmm. But then it's 1.16 uh, and proceed just to 1. Ah, thank you very much. Yeah, so this, that's Dan Saras and this person here. Giving this, yeah. Do you just summarize that in a second? Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so I think so what Dan was saying was that, uh, that when the data set consisted, I think, of you know, about 30 frames of video for each example. So from that, you know, they, could, they could be sure what you know, each frame thing was. But when, you, when humans only looked at a single frame, then they would make mistakes. I think that's what Got Dan it. was okay. saying. Yeah. Should we move on? Another question? So about your, the visualization of your feature. Yep. So that there has anything to do with this reversibility of the network? Say, uh, right. Yeah, well, so it's important. Yeah, so that's right. So that, that, the decombinant thing we were using is actually an unsupervised model. And we would really like to be able to sort of connect the two. Sorry, the question was, uh, does the, do the visualizations have anything to do with um, the unsupervised learning and sort of, you know, uh, feedback in the model, I guess? Um, so uh, my response would be, um, yeah, so that, that pathway is, a, is an attempt to kind of invert, you know, the model. But you can't truly invert it because all these pooling operations are losing information and stuff like that. Um, uh, it, is, it is one way to kind of introdu to introduce a sort of uh, reconstruction term into the whole, alongside a sort of feed-forward uh, term, as it were. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm just I'm trying to say, yes, it, it was originally designed as a, uh, an unsupervised learning algorithm. And it's not like it does give you a direct inverse, though. Of, 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 it's, not, it's not truly showing you what's really happening, but it's giving you some feel for it. I mean, I, I do have some other slides, which, which I didn't show, which do sort of validate those visualizations and show you they are actually are fairly accurate versions of what the network is picking up on. The question right to the back. Speak nice and loudly, please. Sir, do you have any tips for initialization of the weights? Oh, is this okay? Tips for initializations of the weights. Um, I think um, it depends on the scale of your input. So if you're uh, generally, I think, the tr I think this is what Alex used, I think what we used um, was like Gaussian noise with zero mean um, very standard deviation like 0.01 or something like that. And then um, it should be a bit different though for the first layer because if in Alex's model he didn't, he wasn't normalizing the first layer to be z images to be, so the images weren't normalized to be 0, 0.01. They were sort of, you know, 0 to 255. So once you've done the mean subtraction, they'd be minus 128 to plus 128. And so therefore, therefore the scale of those first layer filter filters needs to be bigger than the subsequent layers. Um, sure. uh, Uh -huh. that works right. better than the uh, sigmoids. So once you are at the uh, uh, flat part, right. zero part, you have absolutely no graded information. Uh -huh. So how, how do uh, the learning algorithms overcome that? Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think it's, I mean, obviously the biases, so the biases can, can move that point around. But I agree that once you're in that zone, um, I mean, it's true that if you initialize everything so that all, everything is in that dead zone, then yeah, there's no gradient in the thing and it doesn't work. I think, the, but the point would be that only a very small, I mean, when you initialize normally, only a subset of the units would ever be in that uh, uh, dead zone. It's true. So how does it, so how do you pull out of that? Um, um, you know, I'm sorry, I'm being a bit stupid. I must, I'll come back to you afterwards and think about it because there must be something I'm missing there. I guess only some of the patterns are in that flat region, they're ignored yeah. anyway, so you don't want to train on them. So yeah, so that's it. Yes, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah, for some examples it'll be in the dead region, but for other examples it won't be, and hopefully then, um, then you'll be, get you, from those other ex exemplars, then you will have gradient information to pull out of it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. But can you say something about 22K class ImageNet? Oh, right, so, um, yeah, so a lot of people are focused on running on the, what's actually the smaller version of ImageNet, which is the 2012-2013 set, which is 1.3 million images or something. Um, uh, we, but it turns out ImageNet is actually much bigger than that. It's a full 22,000. So we, um, we have run internally on that, and it does seem to work pretty well. Um, <laughs> of course, it takes so much longer to train the whole thing. Um, I, can't, I can't off the top of my head give you any sort of definitive, like, train or, sorry, any test or validation numbers. The problem is there's no defined test set for that. So you could, I suppose you could always try and up using the 2012 um, validation set and see how that goes. Um, we've trained on it, and we got, did get some quite impressive numbers, but it was just on the training set. So it's a bit, I don't want to say the numbers because they don't really mean so much. Yeah. Can you give some big picture about how do you do the yeah, 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 yeah. Let's repeat the question. 
Yeah, the question was how does the unpooling operation work in that decomponent thing? Um, yeah, so hold on. I have bazillions of, oh wait, it was up there. Um, yeah, okay, so this is a bit I didn't really, I skipped over these slides, so I didn't it must take too long explaining it. Um, so this is how it would work with one layer. There's your convnet, you filter, you rectify, you pool. As you pool, you're going to keep around these locations so that when you come back down again on the deconvnet, you can use these switches to do the unpooling and then use your rectify linear again. And then the filtering here uses just the sort of the, the transposed version of these filters. So what's going on in this max pooling operation? So this is what's happening is that here you have, um, oh, wait, no, 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 go back because it's, the slide's hidden, so I can't see it if you... Oh, that was, was that me who did this? Or? Sorry. <laughs> I thought it was the AV people. Um, sorry. sorry. Okay, yeah, so here, um, crazy slide. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I'll just not use my pointer and then it'll all be fine. This thing's going on. Okay. I thought Max was supposed to be easy to use. Get your Windows machine afterwards. <laughs> okay, hold on, hold on. Okay, I will get this. I will get this. Okay. Um, there we go. <coughs> Unhide it. Okay. Then it should work. Yeah. Okay. So sorry. Uh, this is your feature map feed incoming feed forward. You got your. I've drawn it here. Sorry, the colors are all whacked out for some reason on the projector, but. It's not, it's not my end, I think. It's the AV people's end. Um, so there are different colors here that you can't see for the different zones of pooling, two by two. You take the max in each one. There are your max activations. But you also keep around the um, location. So this guy here, this one over here, came from the top left. And he's, you keep that location around. So when you come back the other direction, you take this guy and you put him in the top left. So it's not a true, in, you can't really invert this operation because obviously all these things are zero here where there was, when, when there was stuff up there. But it's, it's some mechanism to sort of put these things in place. And it's certainly true that if you want to invert these models, there's enormous amounts of information in, the, in these switches. Okay? So that if you, if you just put the, these activations down randomly, you'll get garbage coming out. Okay? So, so it um, would be hard to do it for a, like a sum, sum pooling. I'm sorry? It works better for a max pooling, the um, That's right. Well, so yeah, some, yeah, if you try to invert the sum, then you just end up sticking down like a kind of average mess over yes. everything. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I think we're, we're just about out of time, so we'll, we'll wrap up there. But this has been a fantastic tutorial, Rob. Really a tremendous survey of this uh, very important, very exciting field. So please, let's finish by uh, asking you to join me in thanking Rob for a wonderful job. <laughs>